Uh, good morning, and welcome to the Board of County Commissioners agenda setting and work <coughs> session for September 24, 2019. We'll start with introductions. I'm John Hutchings, uh, the chair of the board, and to my right is... Ty Menser. Gary Edwards. Vicki Larkin, Commissioner Edwards' office. Robin Campbell, Assistant County Manager. And in full support, we have so again, thank you uh, for watching. Thank you, folks, for being here. Uh, we're going to go through the agenda for this afternoon's BOCC meeting starting at 2 o'clock, and then we'll hit uh, next week's agenda, and we'll go through the, the list of items on this sheet. So starting with the uh, agenda for this afternoon for September 24th, We'll call the meeting to order about 2 o'clock, and then we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance uh, led by Commissioner Ty Menser, and then uh, allegedly an approval of the agenda and approval of the board meeting minutes from September 17th. Then we get right into presentations. Uh, the first one is a proclamation for Civility and Conflict Resolution Month. Yeah, uh, And uh, he's part of the uh, conflict resolution uh, board, I believe. And uh, he will give you uh, a little bit of a background and the importance uh, for you to consider this resolution. OK. Anything regarding civility and conflict? Sounds good. <laughs> it should sound good. <laughs> All right, thank you. Next is, oh, we're doing another one that's not on the agenda, yes? The National Voter Registration Day? It's on here. It's on the agenda. Oh, the auditor is next. Okay, got it. Thank you. So, a proclamation for National Voter Registration Day. So, uh, this happens once in a, in a blue moon. The, actually, the proclamation you're considering is on the day of the proclamation. So, today, uh, September 24, 2018, is National Voter Registration Day. So, this proclamation for your consideration will be to uh, celebrate today. And uh, the other uh, county auditor, Mary Hall, will be in attendance. She will give you uh, a little bit of uh, background related to this proclamation. And um, uh, you will be able to ask any questions you may have of her. OK. Any questions? No, sir. That one? No. Nope. I'm sure the auditor will make it clear that people can register all the way up to the day of the election. <clears throat> yes, yes. All the more reason we need more drop boxes and, uh, and reimbursement from the state for elections. Number one on the agenda is opportunity for the public to address the board. Romero, you aware yes, of uh, you probably may receive from public testimony uh, related to this afternoon's um, uh, public hearing uh, when you will be uh, taking uh, public testimony related to the Thursday uh, um, uh, Thurston Conservation District raising and charges. Uh, you may receive public testimony during your regular board meeting, and also you may receive public testimony from uh, uh, perhaps Mr. Pettit related to the courthouse uh, as he submitted uh, another correspondence uh, to you and myself um, over the last weekend, I believe, yeah. Okay. You aware of anything that might pop up at public comment? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. All right, thank you. Number two, county manager's update. Uh, I'd like to follow up um, related to the faith harvest helpers, and you have today's on your agenda uh, later today, this morning, a little more in detail. Um, you receive in the last two weeks um, uh, public testimony related to this particular uh, location. And, um, and this item is, is related to a, a, a compliance-related issue. Um, also, this was part of, a, of an article the Olympian published maybe two, three weeks ago. And I'd just like to chronologically walk you through as to what we have done and perhaps what the options ahead uh, on this particular compliance. And again, uh, we'll go in more detail uh, today on item number six of your agenda. All right. Anything regarding that? Nope. All right, thank you. Then that takes us to agenda item number three, the consent items A, 
B and C. And so 3A is public works. Yeah, uh, you reviewed this item um, last week, commissioners, and the proposal is for you to decrease the petty cash on the ERNR operations from uh, $500 to $100. That's a reduction of $400 uh, for the petty cash account. Um, the, there is no longer needed to have this much money on, the, on, the, um, on this petty cash because most of the transactions as of late are done electronically. And for your consideration to reduce that. All right. Nothing. Uh, 3B, uh, CPED. Yeah, for your consideration, you had some feedback. Uh, the Mr. Scott Vaughn, who was serving in the Agriculture Advisory Committee, uh, has been absent for quite some time, uh, maybe four months. So uh, Stephen Brownwell, uh, the, um, the director for the uh, Wasu Extension, has requested you consider removing Mr. Scott Vaughn uh, from the Agricultural Advisory Committee due to unexcused absence um, in the last few months. Uh, with this action, uh, if you decide to move forward, then it will give you the opportunity to look for somebody uh, who represents uh, in the Agricultural Advisory Committee. Yeah, I remember that discussion. Yeah, you have anything further? Anything on that? Okay. No, sir. And then three, see the auditors, uh, the financials, the voucher list. Gone through that. Yeah, that's your weekly update. Okay. Approval. Sorry. May see. May have any questions or polls or anything like that? No. no. Okay. Agenda item number four. Department items. We're going back to CPED. Uh, authorizing the director of CPED to execute an IA with Thurston Conservation District. Uh, yes. Um, you also re, uh, reviewed this item last week, and uh, Thurston County applied for it uh, for a grant. It was awarded from the Department of Ecology through the National Estuary Program, also known as NEP, to develop an incentive program to motivate voluntary restoration of riparian <clears throat> areas. Uh, I think it's pretty known that the lack of mature vegetation along streams can contribute to a variety of water quality problems, including warmer temperatures, the lack of shade, increasing erosion, and flood issues, and increased <clears throat> pollutants and runoff. So this particular item for your consideration is to, for the county to get into an interagency agreement with the Thurston Conservation District for $36,875. That's the value of the grant. Um, uh, they, uh, and the Thurston Conservation District will go through the process of um, doing the, the public outreach and consultation services. And I believe this, um, this particular uh, uh, agreement and given to the Thurston Conservation District because the Thurston Conservation District has other activities that can be uh, used as a synergy to this particular outreach related to this grant. Um, you had some questions last week that perhaps can we divert these dollars to other um, areas of the county? And uh, no, because the, uh, the, the, the grant itself was applied for a specific purpose. And again, and again it was to uh, develop a program to motivate voluntary restoration in riparian areas. And this, um, um, uh, yeah, and, uh, and also you will authorize the director of CPED to sign an agency agreement with the Thurston Conservation District for $36,875. There is no uh, county dollars associated with this in a local agreement. Okay. Tie in. I just have a question on the last sentence. Uh, it just says, unless I missed it, up to one year. That's, is that typical? Is this wide open, up to one year? No more than, but... No, what it does, you send the agreement extended. and the extension up to one year. Okay. Uh, and that's the limitation. Before it comes back yeah. again. Okay. Thank you. Agenda item number five, public works. Uh, appointment to the Noxious Weed Control Board. Yeah, this is a, uh, uh, an item that uh, you have discussed um, for the last three weeks, uh, two weeks. And, um, and this is really for you to consider appointments to the uh, uh, Thurston County Noxious Weed Control Board. As a matter of background, um, under RCW 17.10, um, defines the, the uh, weed board obligations and, and responsibilities. And uh, that is uh, formed by uh, five uh, districts 
in the county. Those five districts are not aligned to the county commissioner's districts. It's a little bit different. So on the RCW 1710, the Weed Board publishes a um, public notice calling for interested individuals to apply for the open positions. The call for applications was posted on the Olympian on July 28th and August 4th, 2019. Applications for appointment, including the signatures of at least 10 verified registered voters residing in the district, were received by the deadline of August 21st, 2018. So I, 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 sent, I put in your inbox copies of the three applications uh, with the 10 signatures of registered voters within their districts, <coughs> and uh, there were no additional applications received other than the three. So as a result of that, the Weed Board um, uh, uh, held a public hearing um, as a requirement under RCW 1710 and to hear public testimony related to this, those appointments. That public hearing occurred on August 26, 2019 at the Tilly Road Campus Public Works. And as a result of that, the Weed Board recommends the Board of County Commissioners to consider the appointment of um, Mr. Uh, Ms. Carol to District 1, again the District 1 of the Weed Board, um, uh, Mr. David Mills, District 2, and Mr. Paul Thompson for District 3. And um, Tim Wilson, the manager of, um, of uh, the uh, Noxious Weed is here um, to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions? I don't have any questions. Any questions? Uh, yes. Tim, would you please come up? Thank you. Uh -huh. I see notes made on several of the signature sheets, and what do those represent? Uh, Tim Wilson, Water Resources Manager. Um, so per RCW, as Romero outlined, um, the any applicant uh, to serve on this board has to have the signature of 10 registered voters from within their district um, sign. So when we receive those applications, uh, staff goes through and verifies, works with the auditor's office and, and verifies uh, that they are valid. Um, so that I think that's what you're referring to as far as the notes. And then all of them, I mean, maybe something turned in two sheets or something, but I see some one. One sheet here has five on it. Maybe they turned in a full sheet somewhere else, and one has seven. That's that's all I'm asking. I'm just wondering about. You had some questions about uh, whether you could find registered signatures and not found, and all that type of thing. That's what I'm wondering about. So, mm -hmm. did we meet the minimum that? is required for each one of these folks? All applicants met the minimum, and you're correct. Some of them came in on, on several okay, pages. That's good. Good question. Yeah. All right, that's, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. That, then we move into uh, agenda item number six, the county manager's update. Uh, we'll talk about the activities we've been doing the last week, and uh, Romero will follow up on anything else and go through our schedule. That's correct. And then we'll adjourn the meeting. Uh, and at 5.30, we have a public hearing right here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this afternoon, commissioners, you have a public hearing at 5.30, where you re will receive public testimony related to the proposal at, uh, on the Thurston Conservation District, approving the rates and charges uh, for the district. Um, just to give you a little bit of history, back in 2018, the Board of County Commissioners authorized uh, the uh, rates and charges for the Thurston Conservation District for one year. That is um, uh, obviously is going to be end, uh, ending by um, December 31st, 2019. So uh, the process goes that um, is very prescriptive as to how um, uh, this comes to your attention. The Board of Supervisors for the Thurston Conservation District need to hold public hearings, which they did and they have to pass a resolution um, requesting the Board of County Commissioners to consider you authorizing the raising charges. So your role of, as a Board of County Commissioners as a legislative authority is the only authority who can implement taxation fees and any type of uh, uh, impact, financial impact to the citizens in Thurston County. That is your role. Uh, the role of the County Commissioners is not 
to provide administrative oversight of the Thurston Conservation District because the Thurston Conservation District Board of Supervisors, which is have their own election process, they are the ones who oversee the executive director as well as the operations of the, of the district itself. So it's a little bit different uh, in, in terms of that relationship. And again, your responsibility is, is to approve any taxations and the rights, uh, rates and charges, in this case, it's for the Thurston Conservation District. This afternoon, I only have one motion for your consideration, is to consider closing the public hearing. And I will bring this item next week and uh, where you will have the opportunity to uh, hear from my point of view all the feedback that you have received in, ter in terms of public testimony. And next week, I will ask you two questions. Um, I will ask you two questions, whether you'd like to implement the rates and charges, and the second will, will be for how long. And, um, but again, uh, please don't exercise that right now. We'll just give you a heads up as to how the process will work next week. Okay. Questions, Good. comments? I have a question. The uh, public comment period is still open until we choose to decide. It was until uh, or is five. It in, uh, the written testimony that we received closed yesterday at five in the afternoon, and uh, obviously the public they come today they mm -hmm. can submit a written testimony or they can give you a verbal testimony in support or not of this proposal. Yeah. But if anybody else comments or sends in an email between uh, well, tomorrow and we just our decision. Do we ever see those? Do we not accept them? Do they not come uh, into the file? What, what do we do with if, those? If we go by, by the strict uh, word of the law, you shouldn't consider, but most likely I will bring those to your attention um, because it's, it's prudent to have those also. So it brings up a separate topic for discussion, and that is why do we build an artificial deadline? Well, it's prescriptive. Um, and, you know, sometimes the comments that you receive, uh, whether it influence your decision or not. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's just to facilitate the, uh, the citizens the opportunity to give you their perspective. I think it's because sometimes, it? some, I mean, we have the right to make a decision come after the public hearing. Right. So we wouldn't want citizens to think they have more time. It's time to let them know. If you want to be 100% sure we're going to see it, submit it by the public by hearing the date, or yeah. by the date we set. Otherwise, you know, but if we don't make the decision, of course, people can send stuff in and we're going to read it because that's what we do. But, but you, if you want to be safe, uh, you want to meet the deadline. And that's, that's county policy. That's our own policy. It's not, it's not attached to any uh, legislative type authority. Closing. Uh, I, I think it's related to uh, the statute, but let me check on that. Good I think it's both the statute and county policy. Yeah, uh, and I, I understand. I appreciate that. All right, that, that concludes the, uh, the public hearing then. And we're moving on now to review the agenda for next week. And yes, it is October 1st, next Tuesday. Summer's over. We'll call the meeting to order at 2 o'clock and pledge of allegiance to be led by <coughs> Vice Chair Gary Edwards and approval of the agenda and meeting minutes and move into presentations, the first one being emergency services. Uh, thank you, Commissioners, for your, uh, your consideration is to uh, proclaim uh, the week of October 14, 2019 uh, as the Thurston County Flood Awareness Week. Uh, the Director of Emergency Services, Kirk Harden, will be here to give you some background. In fact, he is here today to give you a background if you, if you need additional information related to this proclamation. Okay. And we'll get this to, we'll get this to sign. Any questions on that? On the proclamation? Nope. All right. Thank you. you got easy. Thank you, Kurt. Good gravy. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, now we're moving into uh, another proclamation walk to school month. Yeah, this now is the a. Snow levels dropping. This is, a, school. <laughs> this is a yearly proclamation and um, where you, the board considers the October 2018 as the walk to school month. And in fact, there is also a specific activity scheduled for Wednesday, October 2nd, uh, 2019, in which uh, the, the board is more than welcome to attend a, uh, an event on walk to school, to celebrate walk to school day month. Uh, Chris Hawkins um, is here from Public Health and Social Services, 
And I would really like to ask him to come just to give additional perspective and the details of the, of the October 2nd event. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning, Chris please. Hawkins, Program Manager with Thurston County Public Health and Social Services. And uh, this proclamation is one that we've done each year with you uh, to recognize the importance of walking to school. Um, this is celebrated around the country and around the world, really, in October, um, with the first Wednesday in October, usually International Walk to School Day. And we are participating in an event, at, we're actually supporting an event out at Olympic View Elementary School in North Thurston School District on that morning um, of October 2nd. So meet up at 7.45 a.m. if you're interested um, to walk with a group of kids uh, to that school on a newly completed project that uh, Thurston County Public Works has constructed now for that school to make it a safer walking route to Olympic View. Um, and this is, as you recall from our Board of Health meeting earlier this month, um, connected to Safe Routes to School efforts um, around the county and as an effort to both prevent injuries and to encourage more physical activity on the part of kids and families. It's a way to contribute to long-term health. Okay. What time is that? 7.45 a.m. Wednesday, October 2nd. Uh, Chris, uh, the... Um one of the Olympia School Board members and my son, and my son play soccer, and I was, saw her yesterday just by a chance, and she was mentioning some, uh, like a meeting that you guys had where you're trying to do some coordination between what Olympia is doing with schools. You're nodding, so it sounds like you know what I'm talking about. Yes, indeed. I didn't, I just, I didn't get a complete understanding from her because mm -hmm. we didn't have much time. So I was just wondering if you could, if there's anything that you wanted us to know about where you're headed with that or or what the issue is. Sure, this is a, um, a network meeting of uh, various agencies and organizations that are involved with uh, the Safe Routes to School efforts around Thurston County. So it includes uh, Safe Kids Thurston County, Thurston Regional Planning Council, uh, a couple of the cities, uh, the school districts, um, coming together and, and figuring out how best to continue and expand Safe Routes to School uh, to more more schools in Thurston County. And so it's an information sharing network uh, that's just getting started. This is really um, part of an ongoing effort to strengthen uh, what we can do to help kids be healthy and safe. For that. How many schools, schools do we have that are in county that would like be outside the, the purview of, the, of our municipalities? Do you know that? Yeah, there's actually a, a large number of schools that are not in an incorporated area in Thurston County, and in fact, many that are within the more urban school districts. Olympia School District has a few schools that are outside uh, of Olympia city limits. North Thurston has several that are outside of Lacey city limits. Uh, Tumwater, similarly, Tumwater School District. Um, uh, I think most of the South County schools in Yelm, Tonino, and Rainier are in within city limits, but they serve an area that's uh, quite a bit beyond those city limits. So. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of uh, rural, rurally located schools and then many schools that st serve that, that broader area. It sounded to me like the, in this case Olympia, because that's who I was talking to, was trying to work on s almost the exact same elements that we're doing at <coughs> Olympia View at their schools that are within their city. Yes. And they wanted to make sure that, that we could work with them. You know, and sound, and I, I told them that I thought we were, because I remember, he, after Olympic View, we have other plans to keep going, right? With, That's right. I can't remember what the next school on your list is. We, uh, we were working with uh, Safe Kids Thurston County on a proposal to do a, an assessment and action planning for, um, I believe, Pleasant Glade Elementary School is the next one that we have identified as a <coughs> school that has a fairly high uh, free and reduced lunch rate, which means lower income student population there. And it's sort of on the very... Uh, edge of the urban area out in the county, um, but the area that it serves encompasses uh, some urban areas as well as rural areas, so it's an interesting opportunity uh, to improve conditions there um, on some busy uh, higher speed roads and uh, also benefit nearby schools like Chinook Middle School and North Thurston High School and South Sound High School, I believe, as well. I told her that my sense was that the board, you know, very much supported these efforts because that's the sense I've gotten from them that we, you know, that we do, you know, do what we could to help coordinate those efforts. So thank you. You're very welcome. Anything on that? Well, 
just because I have to take notice of it. One of the whereas, whereas community members and leaders should work together to construct missing sidewalk connections and improve street crossings in neighborhoods around elementary, middle, and high school street uh, schools. <laughs> I contend that uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife doesn't care about our kids, and the reason I say that is Squally Middle School. We've been trying for over four years now to upgrade our sidewalks, put in crosswalks, put in turn lanes, and uh, we've been stopped from doing that because of the Mazama Pocket Gopher and, and their inability to grant any leeway so that we can put together safer walking conditions for our kids in school. So I just, uh, I wonder almost if one of these whereases shouldn't include when it's safe to do so. I'd hate to think we're encouraging. We have, we've already determined it is not safe to walk there. We're gonna spend $4 million there as soon as we get the red light or the green light to do it. So just point of interest. Are you suggesting that be added when safe to do when so? When safe to do so, I think it'd be, in, it'd be you know, worth putting in there. Somewhere. I think, I think the point about there being some unsafe conditions in the community and, and not encouraging, obviously taking undue risks <clears throat> to walk in areas that don't have the sufficient infrastructure and, and facilities in place is a, is a very good point. I think that safety element is certainly in here. Um, I can look for a way to, to okay. encompass that more directly, but I, I think we're, we are trying to make sure that kids and families do walk in places that are supported for that activity. Um, it just doesn't seem right to me that we, uh, we uh, prioritize the gopher's life over our kids' life. That's, all. That's what this is all about. I, I, I encourage the board um, to be cautious on having a formal document where we outline that we have unsafe conditions. Um, that creates a little bit of a, a, a potential risk. Um, certainly, we have uh, facilities that are not up to par for pedestrian activities. Um, but I, I strongly encourage the board not to get into the uh, uh, language of outlining the formal document that we have unsafe conditions. No, no, my, I, my, my, my concern is that we just say when safe. Right. That's all. So I just use that as an example. And I think what you were trying to, I don't know if you were trying, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, Chris, but I think number, the first whereas uh, is inherent in what Commissioner Edwards is saying, uh, and to address uh, uh, County Manager Romero Chavez's comment, Thurston County, um, whereas the health, lives, and safety of Thurston County's youth can be protected if communities take steps to make pedestrian safety a priority. That, when I read that, I'm thinking, that's, that's, throughout, that's the common thread throughout the entire document, is take safety first, however that, whatever that means to you. But your point's well taken, but so is yours. Did you have something further? No, no on this item. Okay. Any further on that one? All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, next is going to be the opportunity for the uh, public to address the board. Uh, be, before, may I ask the board to go back to the previous agenda um, mm -hmm. related to the public hearing this afternoon. Um, I just got a note uh, stating that uh, the public notice of the public hearing, uh, uh, the public comment closes today at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So I stand corrected of what he has stated in the past. So, okay, so 4 o'clock uh, The public, uh, the formal public hearing, uh, public comment closes today at 4 o'clock. Okay. For the record. Perfect. And so any of those comments will be presented at the, uh, at the 5.30 yep. public hearing. Okay. Thank you. And it's a bit premature to uh, project what might be coming April, I'm sorry, August, I'm sh October 1st uh, for public comment. But do you, can you uh, predict something? Uh, I tried in the past and seemed like I never hit the mark. <laughs> <laughs> How about my seatmates, anything that you're aware of? Oh. Okay. Then we'll go through the uh, county manager's update and then move into uh, consent items A and B, the first one being uh, the IT. And I see we have Dennis Osorio, our director, IT director here. Yeah, this is for your consideration, uh, is for you to authorize the purchase of, um, of a, a new technology 
uh, uh, laser, laser fish uh, for $41,680. As a matter of background, uh, Thurston County uh, currently uses Microsoft InfoPath application. In the InfoPath application, the commissioner's office uses that very heavily. That's the, how we manage the, uh, the AISs, the uh, items that come to you in an agenda setting or uh, Board of County Commissioners. So uh, this particular product uh, has been discontinued uh, since 2013. So we have been chugging along as to how we're going to be able to replace this. Um, so at this, at this time, um, we need to you know, bring to a different platform that is going to be supportive. And Lister Fish is the one who provides that environment, a new environment that can be supported and connects with the rest of the systems that we have in the county. Uh, um, you may ask as to why, um, uh, although there was, uh, Microsoft has stopped supporting this, you know, this application in 2013 and now, only now you see uh, 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 an action for you, is because we were waiting us to see what will be the best possible application that can actually talk to our system. In Lizardfish, we already have that application in the county. We use that, uh, that process. And finally, Lizardfish has come up with an option as to how we can use these forms uh, to create, uh, to replace the InfoPath. Um, again, this is the initial cost. It's $41,680.95. And also, there is a $5,770 per year as a maintenance as we move along. Uh, the, um, this money is going to come from the IT reserve, has already put in place. We have enough money in the budget. There is no budget authority. The, the, the director is requesting with this action, additional budget authority. The director is asking for this action. And again, Dennis is here if you have any questions related to this item. Any questions? Was there anything that we were spending on the old system that we're not going to be spending now? Aha, uh -huh, Dennis, come on up. Good morning, Dennis Good morning. Osorio, IT Director. Um, the InfoPath forms, uh, it, it was already in the licensing that we had with the EA agreement, but it's discontinued, so we're not going to really be saving any of that. We'll be rolling over to there. Um, but we will, we'll be moving it to, as Romero said, a new supported system. Um, obviously, the AIS is a big one. The year-end is also another pretty big form, and then it'll allow us the services for the county if we wanted to create internal forms and processes for the future to be on a supported platform. Are they going to look different, or they probably would, right? It'll probably look a bit different. There'll be some training. We'll need to make sure that we roll it out with the proper governance and everything, make sure that the impact to the commissioner's office is supported properly. But okay. Anything? No, sir. <clears throat> uh, nor do I. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks. So just to give you a background, maybe Dennis oh. can stay here. Yep. Um, <laughs> What, uh, when a new application comes before you, we have the IT committee, ITC committee, and this is a, a committee uh, that is formed from all the representatives from departments, elected, elected offices, where the, uh, we have a discussion as to what a particular application can come so we don't miss an opportunity that we just make decisions in a very silo approach. Uh, we also have uh, 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 an IT subcommittee, technical committee, that really gets to the point of having a conversation. What is the business needs and how this particular application can meet the business needs? We have changed that approach that it was probably uh, over two years ago, and I think it's proven to be extremely helpful just to make sure that every application that comes to the county serves the, longer, the, the larger purpose of the county's mission and vision, and as well as we don't get to the point of purchasing a, a software that doesn't talk to the other systems. Mm -hmm. and, and that is really the purpose of that. Just want to give you a background as to how any new IT applications uh, come before you. And just to touch on that, it also helps with the economies of scale because everybody's kind of, we're running it through multiple committees, so we're not going to have multiple products doing the same thing. Hopefully, if everybody's aware that we're doing this now once this gets in place. If somebody wants to create a form, they know that we have a proper tool for it and we don't have to go out and buy a new tool and end up with multiple tools doing the same job. <clears throat> Perfect. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. That takes us to five, I'm sorry, to 3B, the auditors, uh, the financial services, and we'll look at the voucher list between now and next week. 
Uh, department item number four is public health and social services uh, an interagency agreement with DOE. Yeah, for your consideration, Commissioner, just to get uh, with the Department of Ecology an interlocal agreement which provide resources to public health and social services to provide technical assistance and education outreach to small businesses to prevent pollution of water of the state as part of the local source uh, control partnership. With this grant, uh, Environmental Health Division staff will conduct uh, source control site visits and pollution prevention activities to small businesses and generate, uh, they perhaps generate hazardous materials or hazardous waste. They have an impact on the water quality. And this is, uh, this is a great program uh, to have an outreach and edu an education component, component to a small business and again to the, with the objective of uh, preventing any hazardous waste to be uh, disposed on the waters of the state. Waters of the state is considered all the, all the creeks, channels, and the Puget Sound as well. Um, this amount is for um, $174,000, and um, it will be covered 100% by this grant, all these activities, and there is no uh, uh, county money associated with this grant. Our story is here to give additional perspective and perhaps answer any questions you may have. Uh, you can have questions, I would almost anticipate. Well, <coughs> I do have one, one question, I guess. Come on up, Art, come on. <clears throat> Join the fun. When it comes to clean water and small businesses, <coughs> uh, what about the larger businesses? And you know, I've mentioned this before, I'm concerned about chemical application in the headwaters of all our all of our rivers in the steep country where uh, uh, the timber industry puts thousands of tons of commercial uh, chemicals I would say the majority of that is uh, fertilizers that get into our waterways they apply them with helicopters and uh, is there any ability there to monitor that maybe Okay, so there are a few things. So this particular program, the, the way state law and federal law is set up, it determined it's based on the size of the business and the amount of hazardous materials that they have. And so this program's earmarked specifically for smaller businesses, you know, so like um, auto repair shops and things like that, that that use hazardous materials and generate small quantities of hazardous waste. They're technically called small quantity generators if you look into the, the parlances of state law. And so that's what this program's about. Uh, when you're talking about those bigger land use applications of things that you're starting to get into uh, different agencies and this program doesn't cover that. Um, one thing we are doing though at your, um, since the question keeps coming up over and over again is that we, um, this past year we've been able to implement a monitoring station way up in the headwaters of the, the Deschutes area to start monitoring water quality to see whether or not uh, particular land use activities would be they forestry or something else or impacting water quality. So I think that's going to give us some good information with which to be able to evaluate the concerns that you've brought forward because Prior to that, we didn't have that station. We weren't able to, to actually have any quantitative data that says, okay, is it good or bad? So that's going to be able to, I think, help us provide information to you so that we can see if, see if there is a problem, we can try to get it addressed. Okay, thank you. That's a good question. I remember talking about this program earlier this year, and so I'm just trying to, remember, trying to put the pieces together, remember what we were discussing. Um, was it an extension of something? This kind is, yeah, or? what happens is um, this is a typically a two year grant. And so um, I don't recall if we, I believe we got a grant extent or an amendment to get additional funds earlier this year. So that's probably what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's uh, as the state budget process kind of renews itself, there's additional funds that are, the legislature provides. And okay. so this, this uh, grant is for the basically the, the period that began in July 1st, 2019, and continues for the next two years. So that's probably what that is, because we often are able to get additional funds or to have a grant amendment to be able to, con to continue or to um, enhance our programs, and we're, we always try to take advantage of those when we can. Good. Does, uh, does this exclude uh, the, the food or restaurant industry? Uh, it does not. What, it, what we do, though, is the way our program works, we work in conjunction with the state to identify priority businesses and things, and so usually, again, the ones using hazardous materials. Um, and I, 
I can't remember what the focus industry group is this year, but it, as Ramiro talked about, the uh, intent is to make sure that hazardous materials and things don't get into surface water. So, um, so it's looking at the way materials are stored, uh, chemicals, they can be cleaners, they can be pesticides, and how um, making sure that they can't inadvertently get into storm drains and things because those release to surface waters or get uh, seep into groundwater, which can contaminate things. So, um, uh, but I don't, I'm pretty sure it's not food service industries this time. Okay, and a final question. As defining uh, what a small business would be, does that exclude a small business that might be part of a national chain? It does not. It, it base, it's uh, based on the amount of hazardous materials that they generate each year. So it could be a big retail, you know, I'll use kind of the colloquial term, a big box store that generates a small amount of waste. That could still be covered, and it, and it doesn't make any difference if it's a national chain or just a local place. Okay. Um, we, can, we work with all those folks, and as Romero indicated, the intent is really to provide education and to make sure that people are doing proper things and follow up on them if, they, if we see something that's wrong. Um, and if we have to, we can get into a regulatory mode, but the intent is to try to provide um, the information that they need so they can manage things properly. Good. Thank you. That's it? All right. Thank you, Art, very much. And I'll sit here just yeah, in case yeah. you have questions about the next one. Just in case of the next one. one. <laughs> oh, that's one. There we go. Uh, that's a 4B, uh, Department of Ecology Solid Waste Financial Assistance Agreement. Yeah, this is a, another opportunity uh, to get some funding from the Department of Ecology. Uh, I apologize to Commissioner Edwards because if you are going to read this, uh, contract number is going to be significant. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> but the purpose of this um, uh, uh, program <laughs> will support a solid waste uh, program permitting inspection in solid waste enforcement activities. Uh, solid waste management is, is, as you know, is the core of public health programs and is required by state law and also under Article uh, 5 of the Thurston County Sanitary Code. This particular grant is uh, for $127,304.50. And uh, it requires a match of $42,434.83 for a total cost of this program for $169,739.33. The source of the, of the local match will be provided by the allocation from the tipping fees. That will be the solid waste fund the transfer to the environmental health on a yearly basis to support this program. There is no additional request for additional funding related to the tipping fees. And, um, so the, and, um, and the reason of that is because we were expecting uh, this grant to come through, and this is just uh, formalizing what we were expecting as part of the 2019-2020 budget. This contract runs from July 1, 2019 through June 30, 2021, pre, uh, similar to the previous item, and that is really uh, related to the state's uh, fiscal year. Okay. okay. I don't know. What, what is this? Financial assistance means what? Yeah, Maybe. so it's the local, so once again, this is Art Starry with Environmental Health, and it's the Local Solid Waste Financial Assistance Program, and it's a... Um, it's a renamed program that's actually been in place for over 20-something years. Uh, and the source of the funding is the Model Toxics Control Account. And um, one of the, this is one of those things where there's a state mandate to do something, and this is an attempt by the state to provide funding for that. So it's, uh, it's not a fully funded mandate. It's a partially funded mandate because we still need to use tipping fees for it. But what it, state law specifies, as Ramiro indicated, that um, local health jurisdictions have to monitor and make sure that solid wastes are being properly managed within our county. Uh, so this provides resources primarily for us to go and do complaint investigations because um, there's, I think our county does a good job responding to the solid waste side of the investigations. Um, this doesn't pay for all the effort that it takes, but it does provide some of the funding for it. Um, it can also be used to do inspections of uh, exempt and permitted facilities. That's what some counties do. In fact, for some counties, this is the only funding source that they have. And, and uh, if they didn't have this, they would probably close up shop on their compliance and solid waste stuff. But, but we're more fortunate, as Romero indicated, because we do receive some tipping fees. Um, so that's, that's what it's about. So, uh, you know, when you... Um, when you get a phone call from a constituent about solid waste or something or someone's managing stuff inappropriately and Mark Coster or um, Maria or Karina go out and investigate it, this is paying for part of their salaries. And so that's, uh, I think it's, it's a good deal. It's, 
Uh, we're a bit disappointed this year that the state didn't provide the funding level that was requested by the Washington State Association of Counties. You might recall that this last legislative session that um, there was an attempt to, um, well, actually, the way MOTCA, the Model Toxic Control Account, is funded was restructured. Uh, there was, uh, they thought there was an agreement to provide a more, a greater amount of funding for this, which funds both uh, the health department activities as well as the county solid waste facility, county public works activities. But um, in the end, it didn't didn't come through the way it was was anticipated. It's about a third of what folks were actually hoping to get. <laughs> so it's a good, so it's kind of a good news, bad news thing. The state is fulfilling some of their obligation, I think, to, to fund these programs. The bad news is it's, you know, in these tough times, the, the money isn't quite what we were hoping for. Well, it's not, I shouldn't say not quite, it's far short of what we were hoping for, but, <laughs> but it's- Perhaps but next it's, time. Yeah, perhaps next time. Did you get your answer? Go ahead. Could you give us maybe an, an example of uh, how this would be implemented? I mean, somebody dump something along the road or uh, well, it's I, should, I didn't bring any pictures with me, but there's a lot of properties where uh, people just mismanage the the waste they've got. It may be because of economics, it may just be because of they're just their practices. But uh, there was some uh, a really good example of, of a while ago is someone dumped a pickup truck of syringe needles on properties, and so we went and coordinated the cleanup of that. Uh, there's some one that we just got cleaned up here uh, a few days, a little way, you know, it was a few weeks ago. It just someone was, you know, they had um, old furniture, they were throwing garbage bags full of stuff out on their property, they had broken machines, they had uh, wood debris, construction debris, it was just a mess. The, uh, <coughs> the neighbors were complaining, and through, through having the resources with this grant, which basically pays for staff time, we were able to work with folks to get it cleaned up. You know, we had to issue a notice of violation. We had to do some other legal things in order to, to gain compliance, but ultimately we were, su we were successful. So those are the sorts of things that we'll get. Um, and, and while people think, oh, it's just garbage, why are we worried about that? A lot of times these things, there's some bad stuff. There can be toxic materials associated with things. Um, we've also, you know, for instance, there was one where the material got introduced into a well. We were able to use this funding source to be able to evaluate the the material in the well, find out what it was, get it, basically get it pumped out, and be able to provide notices to neighbors to make sure that they were aware of the public health concerns. So it, it is a really good program, and and often again, when people think, oh, it's garbage, why are we worrying about that? It, you know, sometimes when people are dumping bad, dumping stuff, they're dumping bad stuff or managing bad, st managing bad stuff in a bad way. <laughs> Just to clarify, this fund does not cover cleanup activities. No, it doesn't cover cleanup it, it, activities. It's a, just so we just can't use it for cleaning it up. No, like no. This, we can, we can use this, this, for this is this is the compliance, and, and as Art stated, it allows for staff to start coordinating as to how a particular <laughs> site can be cleaned. So just want to make sure that uh, the board that, uh, understand this is does not fund cleanup activities. Right, that's a, and there are ecology is attempting to come up with some funding to help deal with homeless cleanups mm -hmm. and things like that, but that's in the future. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Would this cover a uh, situation if, uh, say, a, a, com a commercial, I forget what you call them, but the, the guys that like pump out septics and step systems and stuff, mm -hmm. and if they, you know, they're supposed to take it to somewhere, there's different mm -hmm. places they can go, and if they were not uh, disposing of it properly, would this be the fall within this the This could be used for the, yeah, so if they improperly dispose of septage on property, this could be, a, this would be one of the mechanisms that we could use to be able, or the resources we could use to do the investigation and cleanup. We also have our, our, our septic system compliance folks who would also be involved, but this, this can be used because it's, once you start dumping sludge out on property, it's considered a solid waste. And, and then it have feels, you had those types of uh, complaints? Um, in years past, we've had some, and we've had to go and take legal action. Actually, have um, someone's uh, perm or certification revoked. Um, mm. so. But yes, we okay. fortunately we don't get many of those complaints, but we have had them. Yes. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Art. Well, thank you. Thank you, Art. That'll take us to next week's uh, agenda item number five: the county manager update, and we'll all report on stuff. Then we'll adjourn that meeting, and at 3 p.m. or thereabouts, we move into a public hearing next week, October 1, uh, to consider updates to a code, county code, regarding apprentice requirements. Yeah, for your con uh, consideration, you will hear public testimony uh, next Tuesday, October 1st, 2019, at 3 in the afternoon in this room. 
um, where you um, will be considered changing to Chapter 15.20. That's related to the apprenticeship requirements for Public Works projects. The, um, the, um, the proposal um, that you will be hearing public testimony on is changing the requirements of apprenticeship from 10% to 15% uh, for Public Works projects of 1 million and above. Um, you had, uh, I believe, a couple of uh, briefings related to this. Um, you said this public hearing. And for your consideration, I, have to, I will have two actions for you next week. One is to close the public hearing, and the, and the other one, depending on the public testimony, as an option for you to consider approval of this. Um, but again, the second option is an option for you, uh, not necessarily uh, something that you may uh, take or not. Okay. Anything regarding that? No. Anything? Good. All right, no. thank you. That concludes the agenda for next Tuesday, October 1. And now moving back to this uh, agenda for today uh, for the work session. We're at proclamations and awards. La Bonita Bomar. Good morning. La Bonita Bomar, right. Clerk of the Board. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first proclamation that we have discussed that's on today's agenda is the dispute from the Dispute Resolution Center. <clears throat> and Joe Sanders will be here to present that um, topic to you. The second one uh, we have discussed is from the Auditor's Office, National Voter Registration, and Auditor Mary Hall will be here to uh, give you information about that proclamation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Chris Hawkins has already shared with you for October 1st agenda, the Walk to School Month, and Emergency Services Department, Kurt Harden, will be presenting the Thurston County Flood Awareness Week. As you can see, what I've tried to do is only have two proclamations per board meeting. And so on October 8th, what is scheduled is Auditor's Office, Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and the Prosecuting Attorney's Office for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Those are the proclamations that I have been requested by staff to have for the next month. Perfect. Any questions on the uh, proclamations? No, sir. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So moving into uh, awards or? Uh, I have no awards this advisory week. Advisory commissions, advisory boards? On advisory boards, um, <clears throat> one of the items that needed to be added to this list would be the vacancy with the Timberland Regional Library Board of Trustees, and I will add that. Our public information um, officer, Supervisor Megan, has put together a press release for the Timberland Regional Library Board, and that went out to, to today. It will be going out today. And so I'm real excited and hoping that we'll get some uh, interest on that. Also, uh, we've already discussed the noxious weed, and that is um, on today's agenda. The Area Agency on Aging, which is the other vacancy that we've had for a couple of months, I have not heard back from the Area Agency. I have made a couple of calls, and so I think I'm just waiting for them to have their next board meeting. I think we, uh, we had a canceled meeting that led to that delay, okay. so that's coming up. And that's all that I have. Uh, I do one, one question. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. <clears throat> uh, we have an opening on the Planning Commission, and I'm curious, uh, some boards or some commissions, we are asking that body to review applicants and send them in. Are we doing that on all? I just, I'm just wondering, should that application come directly to us or should it go to the Planning Commission? Any application that I receive, <clears throat> I send to staff of that particular board, but you will also have that application. Okay, so we do run it through that yes. particular board or commission. Yes. So it, it should come to you first. Then. Yes, some of them go directly to the staff of the board or another person on that committee and then they forward it to me. Um, but for the most part, I receive the applications in our office. And then they have an opportunity to make some review of that person, Yes. Right? Okay. But I make sure that they get 
Okay. Good. Of all Thank you. Applications. Just a question. Let me ask you a question. Are, are you concerned with uh, we're not seeing all the applications when they come in? No. They're, get, they're getting weeded out or thinned out? No, I, I don't know as I am. I was just, I've talked to about four or five people about this process, about the Planning Commission position that's open. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really didn't know how to, you know, respond to them. Did they send it to the Planning Commission or do they send it oh, to God. the clerk of the board? Do they send it to the individual commissioner? In this case, it's a District 2 appointment. So I was just looking for clarification. Perfect. Okay. Do you have anything? Uh, are we... Do we advertise? I mean, that's a pretty important uh, commission, obviously. And do we post that, or how do we let people know we have that vacancy? Because that's a new vacancy. For it is a new vacancy, and the first press <clears throat> release, as I was saying, is the Timberland. I am going to be working with Megan to address our public information officer to address uh, other vacancies that are coming up and that we have on our list here to do other press releases. We wanted to. Um, address the Timberland. In the past, what we have done, I've received um, certain boards will do their own outreach. I have in the past um, done public service announcement or word of mouth. A formal process on all vacancies is uh, something that I'm working on with the to get a process in place. So all of them will be addressed um, through public outreach and both social media and actual press releases. And I am working with Megan to, to address the social media pieces. Megan. Uh, Megan Porter, Public Information Supervisor. Uh, we sat down with Law last week and um, started developing an outreach plan to address that specifically is how are we going to respond to vacancies and how are we going to get the word out to the citizens about these opportunities uh, so we're working on a plan on that this one specifically I'll, I'll touch base with law and figure out the best way to do it i don't think sending out a news release for every vacancy is going to be the most valuable way to do that um, so social media having um, law go to one of the planning commission meetings to talk about this is how we need to get the word out there. Um, a couple different I ideas that we have come up with on on how to start filling those vacancies a little bit more efficiently. Um, so more to come on that, but I'll I'll talk to law specifically about the planning commission one as well. I think it's you know it's anything we can do is good, but I would say the a, a new vacancy is in a different category because. You know, if it's been if it's been a vacancy for a while, then an interested citizen presumably would have poked into the website and and saw what there was available, or maybe they check every few, every few months to see what's available because they're interested in being involved. But when we have a new vacancy, somebody who would be super interested and qualified wouldn't know if there's not a way for it if it's not getting pushed out yeah. somehow. Yeah, and that's what we <clears throat> that's what we discussed. I think the best way to do is probably through social media, and. Um, making it clear on our homepage the different types of vacancies. But a news release is only as good if someone picks it up. Right. And so the best way for us to share our media is probably through social media. Um, but that's something that I'm working on in that plan. And, and I'll talk to law specifically about this particular vacancy. Yeah, let me get real quick. Uh, and, uh, and also, if, um, I encourage the commissioners on your interactions with the citizens that you, you go from many different uh, activities that you do to put a word really for uh, perhaps interested individuals. And uh, also that helps, um, you know, to bring any applicants from your perspective or encourage any applicants that you see might be suited for any particular vacancies. Um, let me go back to the Timberline uh, Regional Library uh, vacancy. Last week you asked me to follow up as to the reasons to why uh, Mr. Wheeler um, uh, resigned. I did have a, a little piece of information that it was perhaps uh, health-related issues as to why he decided not to continue on that appointment. Okay. That's all I have to say. So before we, are you, I want to address the uh, Timberland. Are uh, we going to have, do we have Cheryl Haywood, the director, coming in to brief the board coming up or no? Uh, I believe uh, she already did a couple she, of times this year. She um, has. I, I don't think she's scheduled coming. to come and give another briefing, no. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Gary. On, uh, on 
what is there, 42 boards and commissions that we have? Is that what the deal is? We're trying to keep track of, right? So do we post those openings on the county's website as a regular posting open uh, seats on boards and commissions and that type of thing? Or is there a possibly a format we could put together so if a citizen does look on the website, or at least we could maybe refer a citizen to look at the website. If you're interested in volunteering in your county government, you know, go to the county's website and you'll see of the 42 boards and commissions where there's openings or that type of thing. And then they could refer to that individual commission possibly. Is that available to them? I can make it available. I currently do not have on the website all of the current vacancies for the various boards that we have. I guess I'd ask it my used to be up, have used to be up there. That's yeah. how I got on the Water Conservancy Board. I just went to the county website and looked at all the commissions and there was a vacancy and I... And I will have to find out why it wasn't kept, but I personally do not have a mechanism right now in place where I have all of the vacancies for the various boards. It can be put together. And there was a time, I don't remember the reason why it ended up being not kept up. That's been a while. But uh, currently, I do not. Well, we'll, we'll explore that. Yeah, sure. I would think that would we'll be the question. Oh, that's, that's, that's okay. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was already assuming that that was there. Yeah, so I was that, looking for how do we get people's attention. Yeah. I was assuming how do we get people's attention to then to go to there that, and see that. You know, but if that's not there, that's a, that, that that's certainly a low hanging fruit. We'll yes. we'll 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 get on it. Very low hanging, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, all I have. Is, is, do you have more? Or is that no, it? that's it. Good. All right. Thank you, Law. Thank you. PIO check in. Is Megan here? <laughs> Good morning again. Good morning. <laughs> Megan Porter, Public Information Supervisor. Um, last week, Romero presented the um, 3CMA Savvy Award that we received for Best of YouTube for our agenda setting live streaming. And from what I understood, you had a few questions about criteria and the um, comparisons to others, those types of things. Did you want me to go over it just a little bit for you? Did you have that question? Well, I'd like to hear. Uh, what the process is, what what are uh, what does that word really mean? What okay. did we what did we excel at? Uh, so, three CMA is Cities and Counties Communications and Marketing Association, which we're a member of. It's a national association, and there are hundreds and hundreds of members of it. Um, Savvy Awards is an annual award that they do. You have to submit <coughs> nominations for your different projects. We submitted four nominations. Um, the one that we received is the Silver Circle Award for the best of YouTube. Best of YouTube, there were five people who, or five different entities that submitted it, a couple counties and a couple cities, and we received the Silver Circle for that. The criteria is just kind of showcasing an innovative way that we've used a social media platform. Um, we have to provide numbers to show success. We need to note if we used any budget on that, was anything outsourced, and then they select judges across the, um, across the country to review all of these applications. So for the particular one that we, that we won, there was five nominations. Um, for some of the other categories, there were up to 50 nominations. And so it kind of varied based on what the categories were. I'm good with that. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Yeah. Did you have anything to add? So that includes YouTubing this? YouTubing this. This, this is what we want it for. This is YouTube specifically agenda this setting. agenda setting. Mm -hmm. agenda setting. Yeah. Yeah. Live streaming. Beautiful. Live streaming this. So. Beautiful. All right. That answers that question. Good. Uh, do you have anything for, uh, for Megan? For a PIO? I can't think of Good. <clears throat> Nothing? I'm good to go. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I commissioners, if I may, um, uh, on item number one on your agenda today, uh, that might be something that uh, we need to coordinate with uh, Megan, uh, depending on the decisions that you make on item number one of today's agenda. Yes, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we can mention that. Go ahead. Um, I have a few, just a few other mm -hmm. updates. Uh, Commissioner Menzer filmed his next episode of Thurston County Connection on Sab Salmon season and habitat restoration. Um, they filmed down at Tumwater Falls and um, it was a successful filming. That'll come out early October. 
So we're sitting on a wall, the, the same wall that, um, in the same masons that built the wall in Tonino that we oh, were yeah, doing yeah. cutting. Those same guys uh, were built the wall at Tumwater Falls Keith with, and with uh, 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 yeah. Bill. Yeah. And so, well, Keith and Ed, but the two guys that were holding the ribbons, the actual okay. masons. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. yeah. Anyway, so that was kind of cool. And their, their people saw us, and they were happy that we were already using their brand new wall yeah, to yeah. waterfall. So the, the, the rock came from the, the, from the Tenano Quarry? Yeah, mm -hmm. they were. I, I, I won't get the story right, but there was a connection there. Okay, That's all gotcha. I can say. There was, they, they, like, salvaged an old, uh -huh. uh, like, there was an old, I guess, water fountain, and they were able to kind of shore that up. And I think they, they used some Tenano sandstone in some part of it oh wow at tonight i mean because there's a connection there they were already working on the tonino project and then they were working on so yeah it's it, they are very crafty for sure they're yeah. very good and you were there for the yes. uh the uh, ribbon cutting at the tonino uh, veteran memorial wall mm -hmm. we actually and facebook lived the the event and it was very well received lots of views lots of comments it's a beautiful wall mm -hmm. it's well done and the uh, the artistry inside uh, depicting the building. The insets are really cool. Oh, it's great. Yeah, very it's cool. Thank you for being there for that, too. Appreciate it. Anything else? Good. Thank you very much. Uh, public hearing decisions. We already talked about that. You have nothing more on that? Okay. And before we get into commissioner items, this is the perfect time to take a, uh, a break. So we're going to go into recess until 10.15, a 10-minute bio break. And uh, we'll be back. <laughs>
All right. Yep, we're on. Welcome back. It is still September 24th, and uh, we're continuing on with our uh, work session. And next on the agenda are commissioner items, and the first one uh, is titled Courthouse Project Ordinance, a discussion and direction. Uh, yes, thank you, commissioners. Item uh, one and two are, are related, and this is on the heels of, um, of the executive session that you had last week, where you asked me to bring the courthouse ordinance, uh, courthouse project ordinance, back uh, for discussion and reapproval. Um, as a matter of background, um, I think, uh, I, I believe the, um, the county welcomes um, public uh, feedback and public testimony and put us in the position to be transparent and put us also in the position to perhaps address some of the concerns that perhaps we didn't address on the initial action that we presented to you. Um, and this is really uh, the gist of this and also on item number two, um, uh, put us in the position to look at the current code and see how we can probably create more flexibility and be more clear as to how your special meetings or meetings outside of the, of the courthouse can be implemented in, in that. So um, what I'm planning to do today uh, is going to be a, a tag team with Elizabeth uh, on this. Uh, on item number two, um, uh, we also saw an opportunity to perhaps not just uh, bring this item to you for your uh, reconsideration or maybe uh, exercise your vote again. It also is just to add and clarify some of the items within the ordinance itself. So in front of you, you have this uh, version that I put uh, in front of you is uh, in a bill format that gives you an indication of some of the proposed uh, changes the staff is bringing to your attention on this ordinance. So let me walk you through what... Uh, is this different than what's in our packet? I was going to yes, ask that too. I just give you a new one. So toss the ones in the packet. Yeah, I just give you a new one today. It's, it's more revisions. I'll just give you a put uh, a one in front of you. I hope I got the right one. <laughs> no, not that one. <laughs> this one. Yeah. All right. So, um, as you may recall, it was a suggestion that perhaps um, when you to uh, maybe a couple months ago to, for uh, for the board to consider uh, some. Um, exemptions uh, related to this particular uh, proposal they, um, that at this point is going to the voters on April 28, 2020. So the first item is for you to consideration to uh, um, uh, contemplate accepting qualified seniors, uh, disabled, and veterans uh, pursuant RCW 8436381. That is the first proposal that we have before you. And I'll go back and I will, like, I will ask you whether you'd like to support this or not. Uh, the next item, we start uh, changing some of the uh, scrivers uh, errors that we have and provided additional information uh, related to the exemptions on the whereas on page number one. Flip into page number two. And again, <coughs> it, it clarifies on calling for the section number one, uh, title calling for of election. Um, it spells out they propose exemptions to senior, disabled, and veterans. And, um, and, and again, it provides the clarification to the first item. Um, on the purpose, we specified a little more in detail the Civic Center Comprehensive Cooperative Feasibility Study Final Report. That's the actual title of, of that report. Moving on to page number um, three. Um, and, um, we uh, title section 2B as uh, alternative purposes, and this is the language related to in the event for any particular reason, um, uh, the, this project or the intent of this uh, particular project because impractical um, uh, and such improvements are not being able to uh, uh, be built according to uh, this proposal then the Board of County Commissioners have the option to, and the discretion to uh, uh, use the proceeds of this uh, levy lead left to other county purposes. Uh, this uh, 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 item is not uh, unusual in any particular legislative action to just give you uh, additional flexibility as to you go through and exercise your legislative authority. But again, the main purpose of this uh, particular ordinance is, is clearly outlined in section two 
uh, A, um, as to what the intent of this levy led left is. Yes. Uh, can I go back to page two of five? Yeah. Under purpose, uh, Thurston County Courthouse and Civic Center Comprehensive Comparative Feasibility Study Final Report 2018. Mm -hmm. Is that what is what you're planning on adding in there? It, that, that's that? the that's the actual title of the report that it was presented to you early in the year. I guess I guess what I'm wondering about there is that referencing. So we're kind of locked into one of those proposals that are alluded to in that report, and we can't go outside of those proposals. Is that what? What, that what proposal is your talking about? Location. Yeah, location. location. Is, that's where I'm, that's where I'm going with it. Eventually, is location. Are we locked in by having that in there? Are we locked into only those locations that were presented to us? Say a citizen comes forward with an alternative, well, we can't entertain that because it doesn't match with this report. That's all. I'm so the, the, um, uh, my perspective on this is this is just the putting the actual title of the report itself. As you may recall, the, the report including three sites, the West Side, downtown Olympia, and this site. Right. Um, but the Board of County Commissioners are not bound to Anything. Okay, so you that's, have, that's you, what I'm wondering. Okay. You have the option to modify, stop, change locations as you see fit. So, so if the board had a change of heart on their position or something, they could make that change without being locked in. That's all I'm concerned about. Thank you. And, you and this is just the, to, to put the actual title of that report, which is not necessarily on the previous version. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Ty. Are we doing these? I mean, I was sort of just listening for your overview. Mm. Are we, do you want us to ask questions? Well, uh, apparently, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just think on this technical of information by waiting, sometimes we miss what's being adjusted. Uh, I'm not, uh, yeah, whatever way you guys want to Then do let's it. hear the entire overview. Do we have pen and there's plenty of places to write questions down okay. on the side. Let's get okay. the total flavor of the thing before down. we go back and ask that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and on page number three, on the top page, it's just uh, changing the, the titles, really. The intent of the legislation doesn't change and, uh, and make some adjustments on, on changes on, on the chronology of the information. Um, I think the most significant um, uh, item is on the uh, bottom of page three, which clarifies the intent of the language that will go to um, the voters, if that is the desire of the vote, which includes the exemption of qualified seniors, disabled veterans uh, for this levy that left. Moving on to page number four. Um, and this is this is important because that's some of the feedback that the, we had and eliminates uh, the um, uh, eliminates the, the administrative action to add the, the levy lift left dollar amounts uh, because at this point it's unknown how the levy lift left will be uh, uh, in 2020 and 2021. Because the 2018 is some numbers, but it will, not, it will be too premature to set those numbers at this point because the valuation of those numbers will change in next year. So this section, new section number five allows the board to take a formal action establishing those numbers when the time comes. Uh, that's really the, 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 the gist of section number five. We'll have those final numbers in January. Yeah. So uh, the intent of this will be um, uh, what we have is prior to uh, February 28, 2020, uh, if the board decides to move forward with this ordinance, we'll bring back another uh, legislative action where you can set the numbers, and those will be a little more uh, realistic to what we have right now. That is the intent of that uh, section number five. Um, And uh, on section number seven, clarifies the voters' pamphlet, and, and I believe and this is, this is more related as to how the board can exercise the legislative authority to have the pro and con uh, uh, statements. In any, in any valid measure, uh, what it states, I believe, and, uh, is the board of county commissioners needs to have uh, 
needs to exercise a good effort to recruit a committee of three. They will write a pro statement. And also, we have, you, you will have to do a, a, a good recruitment effort to recruit a member of three for a, a, a opposition statement on, on the ballot. So after you have exercised your due diligence to secure, you know, if you don't find anybody, then the auditor is in the position to secure a pro and a con <coughs> statement. And that's my understanding. That's what this section number seven <laughs> does. On the section number eight, um, um, the new section number eight, um, authorizing delivers ordinance to perform others' necessary duties. The county manager's authorized and direct, no later than February 20, 28, 2020, uh, eliminates the, the, the finalize the calculations, and that was one of the concerns was raised before you, and this is more um, uh, directing the county manager to bring, bring uh, an ordinance for you to set those uh, levy calculations as stated in section number five. So that's a revision. That is in gist of the, um, so if I can probably uh, summarize, um, is whether you, um, three elements. Um, one is the exemptions uh, to senior, qualified seniors, uh, disabled and veterans, which is outline the qualification of the RCW 8436381. Mm -hmm. The second is taken, uh, having an additional legislative actions where you can probably have set up the levy calculations before um, February 28, 2020. And the rest is, um, is clarifying uh, some of the statements on the ordinance as well as uh, 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 fixing some of the uh, numbers and sections within. All right, Commissioner Mentor. Okay. And Elizabeth is here too. Ask her any questions. Did I miss anything? Uh, no. So I'll start with the exemptions. Um, this is the first I'm hearing anything about it, and I'm just wondering where this is coming from and what are the parameters of 8436 and what would the, is the financial impact to, to granting those exemptions? Thank you. Uh, this suggestion was made by the county assessor. Um, maybe over a month and a half ago in one of our joint meetings. I don't know if you were in attendance. That and that was a suggestion for him to consider. Uh, at that point, the ordinance was moving forward. And uh, at least from my point, it was going to bring this item again uh, uh, in early next year for your consideration. But this, since the ordinance is, is for reconsideration again, it was just prudent to introduce this. Uh, the exceptions are current to the assessor is, is uh, a very minimum impact to uh, similar to the property taxes exemptions that we have. So it's aligned to that type of exemption. So when we say qualified seniors, there's some, you know, see, there's a lot of very wealthy seniors in our yep. community. We're talking right. about some very small subgroup of, right. of folks. Okay. Yeah. And right. it's, it, it, the, the statute that's cited, and I can look it up, but it specifies, you know, what qualified means. Okay, I just want to make sure there were guardrails on there. Right, right, right. Okay. I kind of caught my attention too because I'm one of those seniors. So <laughs> I was like, oh, I'll get an exemption. No, I won't. Because, <laughs> like, when, yeah, when we were in Hawaii, this, and my dad asked for a senior discount, and the guy just laughed at him and said, well, oh, seniors are only people rich enough to be on this island. So, you know, <laughs> he just mocked my dad for asking. But can I follow up on that? Because I'd like, to, I'd like to know what those qualifications are for veteran, disabled, and qualified seniors. The defin it? within definition, and you have to do yeah, it right now, but a, definitely before I vote uh, on this. Statute 846081, and I'm pulling it up right now. 381. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the statute that exempts seniors and veterans and disabled individuals is 843681, and it's related to property taxes. And 381, sorry. Mm -hmm. Three, yeah, okay, yep. 381, because that's a point, says. Okay. 
So the claim, the person claiming the exemption must be 61 years of age um, or must have time at the filing of the property tax um, retired from employment by reason of disability. Uh, the amount that the person <coughs> exempt from an obligation to pay is calculated on the basis of combined disposable income as defined in another statute. Um, so there's this whole uh, calculation of um, calculating the disposable income by 12. Da, da, da. Actually, I, I should come back to you because I haven't really studied yeah. the formula. I don't know if you know this formula, Roger. I'm not familiar with the formula, no. I do know. I know that the um, property has to be the primary residence of the person. It can't be like rental property or investment um, property. Um, you have to be of certain age. You have to be certain income levels. But I've not looked at the calculations. Okay. And, and, and then they're exempt from paying property tax period if, in these categories? No, or is it reduced it's a or? reduction. Okay. You get a reduction uh, based on that income calculation. Okay. It's not necessarily uh, completely eliminated. Okay. Well, that, that, I can look at it. Yeah. It, you answered my question on that as far as you know today's purposes, understanding where it's coming from, and that it's there's guardrails on, on that. But, but regarding what, what, with what you just said, Robin, when I look at this, it said they would be those those uh, uh, those groups would be exempt in accordance with this law. In accordance with this law. They wouldn't get a reduced rate. They're, they're exempt from they're, this levy. This is, the language here is that this is an exemption. It's not necessarily an exemption from paying anything. It's, it's a, a reduction based on these calculations. So when I see exemption, that's not what I'm thinking. Will you get a reduced rate? I'm thinking you're exempt from this levy. So they're not then. So what the law says specifically is a person is exempt from any legal obligation to pay all or a per portion of an amount of excess and regular real property taxes. So it clarifies uh, all or a portion of. Um, and who's the arbiter of that? The, the arbiter of the legislation? Well, if it's all or just a piece of you that's Ooh. when you go through this calculation yeah, that's that required it, yeah okay depending on the income and that's what we right. would fully exempt or maybe a portion of it is, and the assessor is is, yeah. is, is, is the arbiter okay so this really is 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 aligned to the exceptions that we have under the property tax so there's this non-new uh concept introduced before you we already the assessor already exercised those exempt exemptions Okay, but and I'm sorry to hijack, but your question is is, is no, pretty I'm, deep. No, I'm, I'm tracking your question. I still don't get it. Like I think what it was like, they're getting a reduction on their basic, and then the, the the amount that we're increasing is it a similar formula reduction, or is it ex complete exemption from the extra piece that will be connected to this courthouse? I think is your question, right? That and is there a do veterans? Okay, if you're a veteran, do veterans get it, or do they have to go through the same matrix? Of the, income, the, the same matrix. It's a calculation. The so the there's, same. you know, the, there's a. Okay. Do you qualify to get an <clears throat> exemption? And if you do, then there's a calculation to say how much. It'd be the same for disabled. Yes. And that would be across your entire property tax bill, which is including this. Not necessarily. You have to specify if each segment of the tax is subject to this exemption. This exemption applies to excess and regular property taxes. And what this ordinance would do was apply the exemption also to this levy increase. Because it's a property tax. It's on the property tax. Mm -hmm. You're in the same, the same, same yeah. Same, okay. Same you right? here, kind of. Uh, well, the whole thing's as clear as mud to me, so I'm thinking that we probably need to have a follow up 
briefing on this maybe after Elizabeth gets yeah, up. Uh, uh, yeah, but I'm sorry, I wasn't intended to for you to okay. move forward on this one. This is the introdu introdu introduction of the concepts. But, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, intriguing, intriguing. Uh, my question is, when we do get it figured out, first of all, we didn't have any of this in on the first ordinance that we passed that wasn't quite up to snuff, is that right? So this is something new we're adding in. And, and that we were going to add in at some point later anyway, right? Yeah, and that was a, a, a suggestion by the assessor again. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, do you have more about that it, exemption though? Yes. Okay. And then, if this you. exemption does go into place, how much does that reduce the dollar amount that we're going to be able to raise on that bonding process? So. Uh, is the bonding outfit going to say, well, gee, you just lost 10% of your capability because of this new addition to this particular ordinance? I don't know that 10% is it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's 2% or 20%, but I, I'd kind of like to know that as to, because again, it looks like we would end up in a situation, possibly, that we didn't have adequate resources to do the job at hand. I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm in favor of this. Don't get me wrong. I'm not changing my vote. I'm just wanting to make sure that if we do move forward with this at some point in time, that we've got all those questions answered mm -hmm. so that the bonding folks know. Because I think there's a lot of people that are 61 years old and older that probably are not very rich. And maybe they are in that exemption. Maybe they own a a home and they're on a fixed income because I hear that all the time, especially when we talk about utility rates and things like that. They've uh, maybe they did retire, uh, but then they had a plan and now the plan doesn't work anymore. So, how many people do we have like that in the community? And I don't know the answer to that, and I don't know if anybody else does. Well, that would be difficult to determine how many people. Well, right? but certainly we can probably bring you some information in terms the of the ADC financial might impact. Have that right well, can, I don't know. We can, uh, while we probably wouldn't have information on how many are eligible, we can certainly get information on how many claim yep. the uh, exemption uh, from uh, the assessor. From the assessor, certainly he will have some data, uh, but it will be very difficult to say how many individuals because the economy changes to each one. Well, it's the assessor's idea, so he must have some <laughs> notion of what the impact <laughs> right. is so for he, him to propose it as a good idea. Yeah, when, when he uh, introduced this concept, and, and I just kind of uh, paraphrase what he said, the financial impact was minimum. Okay. And that's what he, he stated. Um, and that was the premise in which we saw this as an opportunity to bring this concept before you. Um, but certainly, we'll, we'll, I'll follow up with, we'll follow up with the assessor to determine in terms of who is, is requesting those exemptions from the property tax, in, in, in terms of percentages, how that affects the property tax, which it will be similar to this. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I would, I would just add, when you ask the assessor, you have Panorama City, you've got a corporate owner of Panorama City with all the individuals that live in Panorama City. I wouldn't think with all the seniors that the corporation would get an exemption and that tax would be spread among all the people living there. I I'm, I'm, don't know. So that's, that's what I'm looking no, for. No, this is individuals. Who owns a property? On residential property, living in their own home, it's that residence that. So does it not include Panorama City then? I, I don't know the, if they own their own places. Do they own their own place? If it's a Anybody corporate know? entity, then no. No, but it's a, it is a combination. They own, they do own property. It and they okay. lease property. So uh, on if, okay. if individuals own property, they certainly could, be, could qualify for this depending on their income. But if uh, an individual's lease property of this corporation, the corporation will not, be, will not qualify for this. I had a resident of Panorama City uh, last week or a week and a half ago ask me that when the property, the property owner gets assessed this, how will that filter down to them when all their fees, uh, fees get raised? And I have no idea. I don't know. I didn't yeah. know at that time. I wasn't going to engage in a social function. Do you own your property or not, and all that? Well, so, that, that would be a, a business decision uh, as to how that yeah. the corporation will. But we can ask. We can ask uh, the the auditor there. Yeah, the assessor that. 
Okay, so, so let me write the question. What are you, what are you uh, specific to that question? Yeah, is it, is it, uh, would this apply to those seniors that own their home inside of Panorama City or something similar to Panorama City? Because they own just a small bit of it, but I don't know if that's all that the assessor uh, assesses the individuals or if he assesses the entire uh, blocks of, of that parcel. I don't know how that's parceled out, no pun intended, or how he breaks that out. I think I understand. Or is it a co corporation that would be assessed that? I don't know. You have the answer? Uh, <laughs> no, I do not have the answer. But substantial or not substantial is probably uh, comparatively uh, I, I don't know the cost of this project in the end. It's somewhere between 250 million and 500 million is the way I look at it. By the time you do debt servicing, interest payment over a number of years, all that. So, you know, 20 million from 500 million or 300 million, maybe that's not substantial, but it might make the difference of whether or not the, the project could be successful, that's all. Okay. Now I'll go back to you and you Just the last on. thing, if <laughs> disabled and veterans are two separate categories, then Oxford comma must be inserted everywhere, uh -huh. I, in my opinion. Um, so can I go to the next issue? Yes. yes okay, so on page two or three, this B, alternative purposes paragraph that we discussed, you know, quite a bit last spring. My question is, does the impress, does the word, does the use of the word impracticable on, I'm looking at Elizabeth. <laughs> the third um, line up. The second one in B. B oh, yeah, yeah. The, the three, uh, yeah, the. If the board shall determine it has become impracticable. My, my question is, does, is there a legal meaning, are there enough, is there legal guardrails, I guess he use that term again there, that that gives the citizens sufficient uh, assurance that that this can't be exercised willy-nilly. There's actual, I mean, is there a legal definition to that, or is there a particular There's no legal, like, guardrail. Yeah. Like in the exemption statute. It's really up to the best judgment of the county commissioners exercising their purview over managing the county budget and county facilities. I, mean, I, I don't have a, I don't have a, you know, this has been a, a, a paragraph of debate. I don't have a problem with the concept as long as the language is, is as clear as possible about the intent that, you know, this would only be exercised in, in, in very, you know, limited circumstances. I mean, we, we lay out um, change conditions or needs, incompatible development. I'm not sure what that might, might be cost substantially in excess of those estimated. Um, I just want to make sure that that's as tight as it could be. Right. Um, I can do some research on, um, to, from, the, from the perspective of how other jurisdictions have approached that uh, paragraph, because that's a common paragraph. OK. Um, when people are I appreciate that, it. just to make sure we have the tightest version sure. of that provision. And I could run it by. Um, our bond council to see if she has any suggestions. concerns. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. More gay? And I just want for the purpose of the public to understand as we get and unravel more of this uh, exemptions, it's not an exemption from the tax, but it, it's a, a qualified person to get a reduction. Mm -hmm. The first thing I had down when I was thinking what it was an exemption, complete exemption, that people are not losing their right to vote period. Uh, I didn't want people to think, well, if I'm exempt on this, on this tax and I can't vote for or against the bond or the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ballot, I want to make sure that every, nobody's right to vote is being taken away or being suppressed, whether they get exempt or not. So that was just one comment. And then finally, on the very last page, at the bottom, uh, the signatures has Hutchings, the chair, Vice Chair Edwards, and just says Ty Menser. Should we put Commissioner in there? Yeah, it had, it had, it had, the previous version had a title, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank that's you. A, that's an yeah. oversight. Um, on, on number seven, the, uh, 
the selection of the pro and con. So if I'm reading this, it says uh, that people will nominate. I'm trying to. I don't have my glasses here, but it's basically, uh, let's see, post publicly accept nominations. If more than three individuals are nominated, county managers shall select committees by randomly drawing. So, uh, but there's also this weird thing about the shall be composed of persons known to favor the ballot proposition. So I'm just wondering, like, how do we satisfy that if people are just nominating? People could be nominating someone that's not known to support. So how do you square those two pieces of that process? Um, if, so ultimately, it's going to be up to the county manager if, in this current language. And this is just a, an example. So, the idea is to try to put some, just backing up a bit in terms of why this language is added, is, is, sim is to try to address the process ahead of time, so everyone knows what the process is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, so getting back to your specific question, so by statute we have to make sure each uh, committee is supported by the people that represent the pro position or the con position. So, um, you know, how do you bet that? You know, maybe somebody that no one, that's never spoken up before could say, hey, I want to be in the con committee. And maybe he's pro. And then they get drawn. I don't know. And there's five nominees, and that brand, that unknown person gets drawn. Right. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I have the same. Concern. Well, that, that 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 is that is the that is the intent of the language. Um, and I go back to your question. It will be very difficult to say, are you truly in favor? Are you truly? In opposition. Well, so I thought. I mean, this is the first time seeing of the of the random draw. I thought we actually it was on us to pick, and then we you know like we know certain people who are known to to oppose, and and, yeah. and and so there'd be objective basis for us to make that determination, and then it's on us to to be fair. Mm -hmm. But yeah. but if we're drawing, we can't be fair, and it's not on us. It's not right. wouldn't be our fault. I mean, right. how would so we could change it. This is a proposal. Okay. This is a proposal. So uh, it, this is, if you want to change everything presented to you today, you can change it. You can, mm -hmm. you can have it that, that you or the, the ones who determine how you want to proceed. And again, this is a proposal. And, and please don't take this that you have to be committed to exceptions, that you have to be committed to this process. And this is, again, introducing a concept to okay. you. Okay. If, if you don't feel comfortable, well, this is obvious. I mean, I, I guess this is my first <laughs> go around with this type of thing. But mm -hmm. you know, things are on the ballot all the time. There has to have been a historical way that this has gone about. This. I mean, we can every year or two, yeah. something big is on the ballot with three pros and three cons. It's not uncommon for the auditor to be seeking people to write these statements. We can certainly ask her how she addresses the known to support or known to oppose. Yeah, and it's and it, it, each jurisdiction, the way it works is that each jurisdiction has played a ballot measure on, typically, uh, commonly it's school districts, fire districts, things like that. They're initially responsible for recruiting people, so they have their own, all their own methods of doing that. Oftentimes they cannot find people to, they usually always find people to write the pro statement, mm -hmm. but they usually, oftentimes cannot find people to write the con statement. And then and they run out of time, so then it defaults to Mary Hall as the auditor, and she goes through the process of soliciting. But that doesn't really answer your question of how people get that in. But but I guess a, a good question point here is: Do you want does the board want to make be making the appointment? Okay. And that can clearly be written in here. Because the, this language is is for you to delegate that authority. That's all it does, but you can certainly retain that authority by eliminating this language. Go ahead, Gary. I guess uh, I don't mind delegating, you know, say to the county manager on certain things, but, you know, this is probably one of the bigger financial things that we're ever going to be involved in. And I think it behooves us to be as open as we can with the public. and make that appointment ourselves and hear those arguments and, and be accessible to the public. So, no, 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 no,
No, uh, is this just a proposal? Though? And, and I look at it as we'll take the responsibility and the heat and, and protect as well. But my, my question is, should this board approve whatever this finally looks like? What kind of deadlines are we looking at? So that's going to be a, a decision. Uh, 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 another question that I'm going to be asking, a couple of questions related to that. So is there, is there any other questions related to this? And uh, let me walk you through to <coughs> each of the elements just to make sure we have uh, okay. direction. So um, related to um, ex uh, exemptions um, to uh, senior, qualified seniors, disabled, and veterans, uh, pursuing RCW 8436-381. I know there's a, 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 a questions that we need to answer, but the concept mm -hmm. of those type of exemptions, is that something the board would like to consider? Yeah, I'd like to consider, but I'd like to know a lot more. No, that's, I'm just looking for consideration whether I keep this item on, on the proposed language or not. That's because the ultimate vote will be when you exercise the vote. I'm good with it. I just want to, I mean, if yeah. I have some, you know, just ballpark yeah. type of understanding of yeah. the financial impact, yeah. then I'm, I'm good with the concept. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll keep that language and I'm we'll bring... I'm good with the concept as well. However, my first thought was if we have a disabled senior citizen that's a veteran, he or she would be exempt, period. But we don't have that option, apparently, per yeah. RCW. But I'm okay with the concept, yes. Okay. Keep Thank it you. there. So the, the next question that I have, and I think I, I already have the answer, is to delegating the authority to the county manager to pick the committee members for the pro and con. Was I sense the board would like to keep that authority to yourselves? Is that? Yes, yes. I, I'm curious. I mean, I, I don't ask. I, I just, if I read this, it's a process that doesn't work because it says the committee shall be composed of persons known to oppose. And then it says, People can nominate, and then you're just going to draw three names. So I don't see how those two pieces don't fit. We can't, we can't be certain that the committee will be people known to oppose if we're randomly drawing and anyone can nominate. So I don't care that it's us. I just want a process that doesn't set us up to not be able to, yeah. to carry it out. And we'll, we'll uh, touch base with the auditor as to how she vetted, uh, yeah. she vets on any other proposals with the pro and con committee. So I'm open to other proposals besides the county commissioner, but if, but I think we're the, if there's nothing better than. Besides the county commissioner or the county manager? I said I'm open to things besides us making the oh, decision. Oh, okay. If there's a better process that's mm -hmm. fair and can meet the, the, I don't want to set up a process that can't be squared with itself. So this language is directly out of the RCW. I'm sitting here looking at 29A32280, and it says the authority shall appoint persons known to favor the measure to serve on the committee advocating approval and shall, whenever possible, appoint persons known to oppose the measure. That's straight out of the RCW. But but drawing out of a ran three random names is not out of the RCW, right? Oh, uh, let's see. Um, it's no more than three members. A committee may seek the advice of any person. If the legislative authority fails to make appointments by a prescribed deadline, the county auditor shall, whenever possible, make the appointments. Um, so it does not speak to the drawing of names, but we do need a process to follow if we have more than three people. And, and I think that was the intent because you have five pro and five con, as opposed to, I think the intent is just to well, then we could pick say, three out of the, the two buckets. Then yeah, we, could, yeah. we could say publicly accept I mean, we could limit the nominations to sort of vetted thing. People, like we don't accept the nomination unless they've known mm -hmm. to oppose or they. Right, and I can, uh, I can, I can play with that. Yeah. Right? And that's I fine. Yeah. But, but but let me ask the question really: Is do you like to delegate that authority to a county manager, with the premise that you stated? And that really, that's important uh, for the board to decide. To come up with a process. No, would you like to delegate this process to the county manager? the appointment 
or you would like to retain that authority? I, That's I, the question I, that I, I have. I don't want to delegate it myself yeah. because I'm, it's too uncertain, the whole thing. So. Yeah, I'd like to retain that okay. it, yeah. Yeah. authority. So, I'm good with that. So we'll revise the language uh, to uh, keep that authority with you. So do you envision, so if, in looking at the county manager you're taking this on, which makes perfect sense, and you all have to be in a meeting whenever you take action, so that will be very public too. Um, do you want to have the process detailed in here that you will be interviewing, or, I mean, we, we can think about it, we don't have to decide now. But whatever you do is going to be in a meeting. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a, maybe a two-step process of reviewing all the applicants and then selecting or interviewing. I'm not sure if you want, you know how. So it would be a public vetting. Hmm? A public vetting of yeah. the individual. Yeah. I don't even think we have to. Do we have to set up a formal application process? I mean, the, it sounds like the statute and what this says now is that we have to make sure the committee has people known and unknown. So right, but there's some process that has to say, we are looking for people. Mm -hmm. And please, if you're interested, submit your letter of interest to, and then right. we will you know. It will be a means of a, a news release or... Of I don't want to limit, I guess what I'm saying is I don't want to limit ourselves to, I, I'm fine accepting letters of interest and throwing them in the pot, mm -hmm. but I don't want to limit ourselves to just you, like, I don't want a requirement, like, you have to do a letter of interest, you have to do a, this, you have to fill out an application. I think we should have the authority to, to select the people that we think are appropriate. It's on us to make sure that they meet the requirements statute. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, so, Gary. We'll come back with some language that's general enough so that you can have your own process, <coughs> but clear enough. That I'm content with the county manager getting through all the weeds and doing all that. I just think it's our responsibility to make the final decision, that's all. I mean, I'm, you know, however you go about it, just explain it to us. Yeah. I, I came up with these 10 people here, there, wherever, uh, so we don't have people being weeded out so they can say, well, I put in and my name isn't even on the list or something like that. So. Well, uh, uh, you know, you're retaining that authority and um, in following a process, certainly the county manager will facilitate the yeah, process okay. for you. Right. Um, really, um, that is inherent of, of, of okay. the legislation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is that right? Yep. So right. just to confirm, um, we keep the exception language in, in the ordinance with additional information for you coming up. Um, Going back with uh, section seven, will you retain um, the, delay, the, the authority to appoint the pro and con committee members? And uh, we'll uh, work with Elizabeth to narrow down a little more and detail the process as to how you may need to go through it. And Elizabeth said she would take a look at um, B to B just to see if there were any alternative constructions yeah. of that yeah. that we should consider. Yeah, and um, so um, at this point, um, I have a, a, a question for you, pending on you know getting the information that you need. When would you like to have this on the Board of County Commissioners meeting for a formal action? I have an opinion, but I'll wait for my seat. As soon as possible is my opinion. Okay, okay. maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> let me back up for a second. Ready. <laughs> let me back up for a second. So. Um, when you took the initial action, you held a public hearing. Um, that public hearing was not required because under RCW 8455050, uh, doesn't require the Board of County Commissions to hold a public hearing like any other legislative actions that you must have one. That was a, 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 a desire by the Board to hold a public hearing, but again, you're not required. The question that I have is, would you like to have another public hearing leading to this revised ordinance? No. I would. Yeah, I would too. I, I just, to, for me, just, this is not, we're not substantively really, I mean, this is, 
correcting some procedural, potential procedural flaws. So it's not the kind of action, I don't see this as we're taking the kind of action that would require a renewed um, round of, of, of input. We're not substantively changing, is my understanding, um, unless something changes. But so I, I'm not sure why we would do another public hearing. Go ahead. I, I, I have to say I do think we are substantively changing when we include the seniors and veterans and disabled and stuff. I think it might be enough of an issue because that was not included in the first one. So I, I, I'm just trying to get ahead of any potential problems. So, and under the uh, under the the belief of being completely transparent, uh, I would love to have one because there may be some folks that had a view prior to these substantive changes. Uh, that would like to voice their opinion, or maybe they didn't come the first time, and they would like to speak out now for it or against it. Uh, in, in my opinion, those, including the, the disabled veterans and disabled, comma, veterans and uh, seniors, that uh, I think it's a substantive change to this, but aside from the little uh, Scribner errors and such. I, I, um, I have to wonder if it is a substantive change, because what the action is that the people are voting on is a lid lift. This is not a special purpose bond. This is not a, a exempt from the lid bond. Um, this is just an increase in your ability to go above the 1% cap in raising the regular property tax. It is highly likely that with or without this language, the exemptions would apply. So I don't believe that this is a substantive change. This is just clarifying that the exemptions would apply. There is a statutory requirement that it is in the ballot title. So in the yeah. first um, ordinance, Right, but this is a raising of the Third regular month. property yeah. tax. So I guess what I'm saying is that because it has to be in the ballot title, it wouldn't just happen on Yeah. I, well, I've heard a I lot of input to... about the courthouse on a lot of wow. parameters. I've yeah. not had a single citizen that said, if you're not if you're not going to exempt, you know, uh, disabled and seniors, then this oral that's, ordinance. That's, not that's just been not what crux. the citizens are concerned about. It is absolutely not. I've taken input from probably hundreds, if not th over a thousand people, and not a single person talked about this in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Right. So I, I don't would agree think with that, that. that we're, if we're doing it, we're doing it just for what Commissioner Hutching said, which is just to kind of give, just to give, just. Just for the heck of it, give people more input. Because people are learning more. I get that. People are learning more about this as it rolls on. Maybe there's value in doing it for that reason. Well, the, the hundreds, of, not hundreds, the numerous people that I spoke with at Panorama City didn't say, I'm not going to vote for it because there's no exemption. Yeah. But they're scared that this is going to pass. They're scared. Now, that came, that came clear, very clear across to me. So I would like to have the, for that reason, like you said, to get it out there. So what I'm hearing is uh, the majority of the board would like to have the, hold a public hearing on this. Yep. Okay. Then, uh, then at that, by that time, we'll determine when the ordinance will come for your attention. All right, final action. When would you anticipate a public hearing on this then? Two weeks? Three weeks? A week? Uh, well, I have to bring an item for you to set the public hearing. Uh -huh. uh, and the earliest that I can bring that will be next week. Okay. And uh, at that point, I will ask you whether you would like to waive the 20 days and just have a 10-day um, public notice. Yeah, we do that. It's not required. So this is an added bonus anyway. Uh, and, and, and you can have a public comment for months Good. if you like. It really is within your purview. The, the, what is required by law is the minimum 10 days. Okay. Do we have to have these, all these decisions finalized before we set the public hearing? Yeah. And so it's going to take longer than that. And well, I mean, we'll we'll have the. That's fine. I'm we'll just saying the, there's not. We we'll have the ordinance based on the uh, on the on the feedback that we receive, somewhat ready for next week, just to send it to public hearing because the concept that we will not change, in terms of uh, exception exemptions and delegation of authority based on the board's direction that I'm receiving, that will not change. What is changing this time is is making sure leading to the public hearing, you get all the answers that you asked today. 
But really, it, at that point, based on the answers, after the public hearing, you can take all the items out the ordinance and change the ordinance because that's within your purview. So my, my question is then, uh, when uh, the public hears this, many of them are scratch their heads, what? Huh? They'll read it in the paper, I would imagine. Uh, but in addition to that, will we be putting out a press release to explain what we're doing and why we're doing it and itemize the, uh, perhaps the, the changes or something like that? So it's not, it's not lost. I don't mean it disrespect to the Olympian, but uh, it's not lost in a story. This is a press release, boom. Dot, 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 dot. Can we do, is that, is that something we should do, I think? I think we should, but what do you? Oh, I'm, I'm fine with the it. press release in addition. Sure, right. Any time we can educate the public about this type of an activity, I think we're better off. And I'm really glad you're here, Sarah. <laughs> I mean, I, part of my thinking of when we, did, going back a step, when we decided whether we were going to re pass this ordinance at all because we did not have, it was not the legal advice that we were required to. It was more an abundance of caution, I think was the word that county manager used. Part of my agreement to that abundance of caution was that this would be lickety split simple. We would just fix it and move on. I did not anticipate that we were blowing this up into a public hearing and, um, you know, all this other press releases and that I mean because that's I think that's sending the wrong message to the community that there's some sort of a backtracking or um, retreat. Uh, I don't I don't want people to draw their own conclusion because that's not my that's not my read on where the board is, is, is why the board's doing this. It was to just shore up a an arguable question to just limit our risk and and, and do it simple. That was part of my thinking of why I supported it. So I'm a little concerned about now, it seems like we're ramping this up a lot more substantially today than I thought we were going to be doing. So we, we, uh, we brought, <clears throat> as soon as possible, the changes to the ordinance before you. Um, but at least from my point of view, I feel compelled to bring to the board the options that you have to engage the public. And, and that is really the gist of my, my comment, because if, if, if I was to bring the revisions of the ordinance next week, without giving you the option of a, of a public hearing, then I wouldn't do you any service uh, as, you, uh, yeah. as, as you expect. I mean, I, and I would think this is, not, uh, in my, this is not what I expected either out of this. Um, the, the however is, I don't see this as a, a retreat or retraction as much as it is. We've revisited and rethought and want, decided to add some things uh, to better educate the public. And I think, by and large, they wouldn't scratch their head and say, what are they doing? It would be wow. That's pretty thoughtful what they're doing. It, but that's my take on it. Educating the public. You had your hand up. Oh, I guess. In my estimation, it's just the reality of the bureaucratic process. Several times now, we've noted that something that was going to be fairly simple <laughs> did not end up fairly simple. Well, the silver lining is we know from our we know that <laughs> folks need to. There was a lack of, of hearing about this from the okay. public, so more attention to it maybe is a, is a positive so the public understands, you know, get yeah. another opportunity for the public to engage with, with the, the project. So, uh, so I will bring an item for your attention to set up public hearing next Tuesday and also with the option for you to uh, go with a 10-day um, a public notice as opposed to the normal 20-day. Well, a very thoughtful and pensive discussion. On a, on a major issue. Good. Thank you. So item number two um, is somewhat related, not necessarily to the courthouse, but is the is the um, the actions predicated the change to the courthouse, and that's related to special meetings as well as regular meetings. Um, I think it took us um, it gave us the opportunity to revisit to clarify the code. And, uh, and, and provide additional flexibility as to when you would like to hold uh, uh, Board of County Commissioners meetings outside of the courthouse. Uh, because I believe the intent of the board is to be proactive in reaching out to the community. And um, so here outlines and proposed changes on the code as to how we can uh, exercise the desires of the board to reach out to the community. You wanna walk us through the changes, Elizabeth? Yes. Oh. Walk us through. Yeah. yeah. So basically.
basically what this is doing is, is um, incorporating the 3632 statutes that speak to board meetings with the existing code. Um, and the existing code was responsible. Are you talking to the oh. microphone? Thank you. This, is, this uh, change, proposed change to the meeting times of the county commissioners is to in make sure that we clearly incorporate 36. 32080 and 090 requirements for board meetings, which are slightly different from the OPMA uh, requirements. So we, um, and, and it speaks to regular meetings and special meetings. And the reason this came to our attention is because when we held the meeting outside of the county seat, it was um, some concern about whether we were consistent with our meeting statutes. And so after looking at the statutes carefully, um, I thought it would be helpful to make, make sure all the statutory requirements are in the county code, which is basically what this is doing. And so that when we look at our county code to call a meeting, uh, the next person that comes in the office will say, okay, everything's in the county code. They don't have to then go research the statutes to make sure that we're doing everything right. And what the RCWs say is that, yes, you have to have regularly scheduled meetings, and we do have that in our current county code. We have regularly scheduled meetings on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. The statute also says that the county can have regular meetings outside of the county seat, but only once per quarter, and only if 30 days notice is given. And so since the board is trying to engage going outside of the county seat for meetings, I thought it was important to put this in our county code so that we follow the requirements when we do these um, quarterly meetings. We could also have meetings outside the county seat if they're um, as a special meeting, but if we have a special meeting, it's um, the subject matter of the meeting must be speaking to concerns or inter interest of the constituents in that part of the meeting. So it's not as um, you just can't talk about anything at those meetings. So this just clarifies the difference between a regular and special meeting, particularly as it relates to being held outside of the county seat. I thought we talked about how... So first of all, the, this whole special meeting provision isn't in our code. It just talks right. about regular meeting, 2 p.m., and it doesn't talk about at all about a, a, a meet, regular meeting outside the county seat Correct. with 30 days notice. Correct. So all, the, all the language in red is new. So that's just adding in. It's not changing something no, that's it's there. No, incorporating existing statutory language. Okay. And then the second question is, this, I, this, and this goes back to our discussion, but the way you framed it right there is a little different. You said we can't just talk about anything. We had a mixed agenda down in Rochester, for example. Right. We had items of unique concern, and then we had items of general concern. And is that, I mean, I thought you, I thought you, you were saying, well, it's sort of ambiguous, but it's probably okay. It's probably okay, but I think it's important to be as clear as we can be. But this is not any clear, I mean, you're just taking the state statute. We're not really clarifying anything. It's, well. I think when you look at what a, regu a regular meeting outside of the county seat looks like, <clears> it <throat> talks about anything. It doesn't have to have any interest to that part of the county. But you have different requirements. You have to have a 30-day notice. Mm -hmm. Special meeting, you don't have to have a 30-day notice, but you do have to make sure that whatever you're talking about is for those constituents in that part of the county. I'm not <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of irrelevant to this discussion. It goes back to our discussion of, of, you know, I mean, what if we talk about, what if the main part of the agenda is related to that part of the county? Are we then precluded from doing other business? Right. I, I, uh, uh, if a yeah. special meeting. Yeah. Uh, that's the difference, a special meeting versus regular meeting. And I think the, the regular meeting allows you to have, in this case, outside of the county seat, and you can have any topics that you would like to exercise your 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 ex, uh, legislative authority, and but that one requires thirty day notice. No, I understand all that. I'm just I'm trying to get 
my understanding of, of, of the discussion last week or whenever it was, was that um, you thought that um, there was some ambiguity, but you thought that we were probably okay with our meeting in Rochester, even though we included non-Rochester-oriented items because we had Rochester-oriented items. Now I'm hearing you interpret that differently and say, we really shouldn't be doing any non-Rochester in that instance well, related item yeah. I, on I that agenda because it was a special meeting. Right, I hear what you're saying. And I do still think we did have interest of special interest there. The reason I'm wanting to put it in the code is because it wasn't clear to people working on setting meeting notices that this was even a requirement. Sure, no, I get it. That's why I say yeah. my, my, my issue is kind of outside the parameters yeah. of this discussion. Yeah. But it just so, so we'll just be more aware when we if we do have a special <clears throat> meeting and really look at yeah it. I'm fine with with that yeah yes sir uh, I'm trying to think how to ask this question without disparaging to anybody but the as you know you're the professional working on this. Do you have, are other eyes on this? Like, if I mean, we can't be the only county that's ever had to deal with this. Does the county, is the Association of Counties for the state, do they have a person that's expert in the field that you just review things to, or do you do it all internally? I'm I'm just curious. I just don't want to make any mistakes. That's kind of where I'm coming from, and I don't know anything about it. And I I know you know way more than I know, but I know you don't only deal in this. You have a lot of other things on your plate. So does it get reviewed by other eyes in, in the professional like arena? MRS, MRSC or Yeah, something that's like kind that. of yeah. what I'm thinking that, will, you know, where we do submit things to them once in a while. I'm just asking, I because uh, it's confusing to me. So and I, I'm going to take your guidance. OK, don't get me wrong there, but yeah. I'm just wondering. So what, what's confusing about what the statute says? Well, yes, as far as uh, when we have to continually ask these questions, does this cover this or that, and what about this, this open meeting, special meeting? I'm just wondering if there isn't some boilerplate language that's already been developed somewhere that we can just, hey, this has been, this is true and tested. This is the way it's done. I'm just asking. I, um. I'd like to ask yeah. you privately, but I'm in a public no, meeting. No, 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 no. I, I'd be happy to reach out to MRSC. What, what I put in the statute is basically the statutory <clears throat> language. Um, but what I'm hearing you say is there, um, I think what I'm hearing you say is how do other jurisdictions approach this with MRSC? No, have? Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I'm just, I'm not against what we're doing. I just want to be safe in what we're doing, that's all. And I don't want to put words in the commissioner's mouth. But this is what I'm hearing is when you make when you bring changes to us, mm -hmm. are you doing it in a bubble, or are you talking with are you talking with peers in the prosecutor's office? Are you reaching out to MRSC? Are you looking to see other counties to see what they do? Is that wrong or is that no? Right? I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm just trying to yeah. you know because anytime you have more than one person looking at it, you might have another idea. That's all. Yeah. That's all I'm asking. Um, I often do reach out to MRSC with respect so on issues that come before me, and I'm. Or looking at statutory language, what does it mean? What does it say? I often reach out to MRSC. For this particular um, proposal, I did not reach out to MRSC um, because I was using the statutory language. I wasn't reinterpreting the language. I was just basically putting it into the code. Um, so well, I that did makes not. Sense to me. But I'm <coughs> happy to reach out to them I, and see what other jurisdictions. I'm not given direction on that at all. I'm just, uh, we're, we went from this very simple change that Commission, Commissioner Mentzer brought about that we're just going to make this simple change to now we're in a pretty complicated process here that's moved forward. And I'm just wondering if that's the normal, normal way things are done. That's all. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I'm just trying to be assured we'll get it right. Do you have anything more on that? So um, then uh, if uh, the board is um, interested in seeing changes to Thurston County Code 2.02, .02, we need to hold a public hearing. So I would, like, uh, I would like to ask the board if they'd like to entertain a public hearing so I can bring an IAIS for you to set a public hearing. 
I just don't want it to be on the same day we do this other stuff, too. I don't think we're going to get a ton of uh, comment on this one. <laughs> no. Just no. importing statu state statutory language into our code. It shouldn't yeah. be controversial. I would imagine it would be a short public yeah, the answers, uh, yes. The, the well, times of the yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I would like to time this. Thank you. I will set up public hearing. I also will ask the board to uh, uh, waive the 20 day and go with the 10 day public notice. And the reason is because we're already tracking on an offside meeting uh, scheduled for October 29th, um, and I think South Bay. And uh, we would like to have this uh, changes put in place just to follow. We can't do 30 day meeting notice. Well, we're, we're just, do regular we're just, to, just, to, just to be safe, we're going to do that, yeah. But I mean, that's what the code statute provides uh, I'll, I'll, for. I, I'm just following. Uh, Council advised not to set uh, any other outside meetings until those changes are in place. So, right. Okay. All right. Oh, okay. Did you have the question? Well, with 30 days' notice, there's no problem, right? For any kind of meeting, we can do a regular meeting anywhere. If you do 30 days notice. notice, it's not consistent with what our county code says. No. Oh, because okay. <laughs> it's not in there. <laughs> Because it doesn't provide for an office out of county seat meeting right now. And the county code. Yeah, and the county code. Okay. Oh, okay, I got you. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I will bring those two items next week um, for you to set a public hearing. Do you like to coincide the two public hearings? I mean, <laughs> one is going to be certainly uh, will draw a lot of uh, 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 testimony. The other one, this one, perhaps not. And we can probably have it back to back. Is that something? Well, if we're going to, I hate to make this more complicated, but if we're going <laughs> to, if we're going to try to follow, be sticklers and follow the letter of this, of these rules, then we, we're going to change this ordinance and we're going to have special meeting, but then we're not, we're not going to be able to address anything that's not related to that particular area of the county at, at the meeting on the, October 29th because we wouldn't have given 30 days notice for a regular meeting. We'd be limited to special meetings. Mm. I, right? I, I'm like sorry, it. I didn't follow that. Yeah. If, yeah. We're, if, if, we're don't, if, if we're not going to notice this as a regular meeting because we don't have it in our county code, by the time we get it in our county code, we're going to be doing a special meeting. And the special meeting is limited to areas of concern to that area of the county. So if we, so if we're going to try to have a special meeting in October 29th in South Bay or whatever, we're going to, our agenda is going to ha need to be limited to items of concern to that area yeah. based <laughs> on back to Rochester. This, yeah, or else we've just done the so same we'll, thing over again. No, what, I, what, what I will plan to do, depending on as to when you take an action on this, I will just move in sometime in November. Thank you. <laughs> that makes more, a lot more sense. Yeah, that, that's that's pro what I'm planning to do. Yeah. And let's talk, Megan, let's talk about that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, <coughs> uh, uh, I will bring an item for you to set both public hearings next week. Thank you. County manager, looking at the clock, where would you like to go next? Um, I'm not sure how some look deeper than others. The um, number three is pretty straightforward, if I may. Uh, okay. Number four is uh, also a conversation just to introduce a concept, not necessarily a, uh, a decision at this point. And uh, number five, uh, initiative, the impacts of initiative, potential impacts of initiative 976. I think Commissioner Messer was to highlight what um, inner city transit perhaps may be seeing some of the impacts on okay. that. And, uh, but really if there's time to concentrate on the Faith Harvest Helpers um, and, and the compliance associated with that. Property. So you want to uh, hit three, four, and five? We want yep. to jump. Okay, let's do that then. Go ahead and three ice arrest. So um, and this is related to that. Um, and you have up in your pocket this uh, information, which starts with this um, pamphlet. Okay. So on the email, you see the uh, uh, Mr. Tunheim was um, approached by Stephanie Powell. Uh, uh, she is a, a U.S. Immigration and Naturalization um, attorney, where she um, asked uh, John Tunheim whether he is interested in placing this 
those pamphlets, these brochures, there's a version in Spanish. I just give you the version in English. Um, and the conversation with Elizabeth is with, because this is a county facility, the prosecutor there really did, doesn't have that authority to authorize what is placed on the facilities. And that is what I bring this to your attention. And this is the intent is to put this brochure, make it available in the premises of the county courthouse. There's potentially some issues um, with this, and this is just the first request and it came to the prosecutor's office, which is why I brought it to Ramirez's attention because, as he said, John doesn't really control the facilities of the campus. John could conceivably say, if he's interested, yeah, I'll put this in my office, in his own office space. And that, um, and that may be the way to go. There's no, the, the, the issue is whether there's any place in the county that people typically can share information. That's kind of the first question. Um, and I don't know if there is. And if you don't have any, then if you were to accept this, then you'd be setting up a precedent to set other, up other information. So those are considerations um, for you to think about. Because if you don't have a place that you regularly accept other things, then you're opening the door to be doing that. So something for you to think about it. So I will bring this item again in, in, in a week um, after you have the opportunity to read the brochure. And if you have any questions based on the information that's provided to you, then um, then we'll have a conversation next We're week. talking about, I mean, there are places in the court where there's like domestic violence referrals, places in substance abuse, and there's little, whatever you call them, not kiosks, but little pamphlet. Is that what we're talking about, is suggesting yeah, that have, we stick this there? I haven't done any research on where, what's in the county, but uh, that is an issue. Yeah, that, that is likely, uh, because we will not be taking, it, we just allow us, for, for instance, we have an information wall down in the first floor here, mm -hmm. something that we can probably place there, uh, this information there. Um, I don't think it's an expectation, it's my understanding that we actively are going to be issuing or handing those pamphlets as I, they come along. I, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. What's wrong with a group or an individual? Do we have a spot where in the courthouse area where people <coughs> come to the courthouse? Do we prohibit them from leaving a stack of brochures or something for people to take? I mean, one way or the other, can, I don't know what it's about. This happens to be about immigration type stuff, but I don't know. Uh, maybe somebody's wanting to advertise that they uh, bail bond. change your yeah, bail bond or change your tire. I don't know. I mean, do we, re no, we, don't, we, do don't we have prohibit that. people from doing that? Yeah, that was my question. Do we vet these? Because if somebody wants to put in NRA. Y yeah, or whatever. Or something. Yeah. There's, there's, the, um, there's the cork board downstairs where people can post things, but they're time limited. Yeah, and who, they're monitored. The and the commissioner's <laughs> office is? But for instance, just to give an example, um, over a month ago, we received, we found pamphlets related to an upcoming um, uh, land use uh, uh, change that you will be considering next uh, year as part of your uh, docket. And it was really very prescriptive. It was in the bathrooms and it was all over laid out in here. Um, this related to the North Point. Uh, and uh, at that point, oh, I believe that it was inappropriate because that information shouldn't be uh, placed on the courthouse. And I took it away and, and I recycled that. That is the information that you need to consider when you set a precedent. Because it's not just this. Mm -hmm. it's, it's some others may be getting access to the county facilities to perhaps exercise or influence in a particular outcome the commissioners may be um, taking an action on. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. That kind of becomes my concern is setting the precedent, yeah. not the particular issue at hand, but the precedent. And, and that's that what you, what you need to consider. Yeah, it could be well, white I, supremacists or anarchists wanting to post yeah. stuff. 
I would say a couple of things. One is I would I would probably defer to the ju the judges. Um, it's you know they're, they're the kind of the, the kings of, of the administration of justice in the county and. They would have the legal training, along with Elizabeth, to vet the accuracy of the information and whether it would be helpful to lit to typical litigants. So, I'm so I, I would I would want input. I would like input, and probably I would defer to their input on that. Second, I would say kings and queens. Well. This is you know this is great to have accurate, helpful information sitting in the um, in the courthouses. But I'm much more interested, and I, I'm broken record, but much more interested that our law enforcement officers are doing what the law, the state law requires them to do, which is to every person they arrest, handing out the notices that's required by law. So, you know, this is great, but the fact that we're t t dealing with this today and not the, a, a far more important issue of making sure that our law enforcement officers are complying with law is, that's my concern. Are you are you thinking that they are not? They are not. Oh, they are not right yeah, now. We had the ICE meeting, and Elizabeth oh. told us that at this point she's oh. still working with the sheriff, but we are not oh. providing those notices that the statute to keep Washington Working Act requires. This related to the new law, yes. the, the, the right the right to work act. The governor implemented at the beginning of this year. It's a brand new law. Oh, well, tomorrow it's a brand new law. Oh, okay. so tomorrow we have that day without a deputy briefing. Perhaps we can ask. Is that because it's an unfunded mandate or something that? So I, I really don't know what the the, the the reasons behind the sheriff's office, you know. But it's something that we need to work with the legislative as to how we as a county are, are responsive to the new law. Okay. okay. I just don't think that we ought to push ahead on this without having more information. Okay. So I will uh, hold this. I'd like to get input from the courts on that. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> You're going to escape while you She's can. running, yeah. <laughs> She's done. <laughs> Dropping the microphone. Uh, so the next, th th this is more of a, a um, last week I had a, a joint meeting with um, the representatives from the offices of um, Representative Denny Heck, uh, Senator Murray's office, and Senator Campbell's office. And we had a conversation that we're interested, obviously, on the on the incident of June 20th, 2019, the ICE arrests. Uh, through the conversation was um, the, the, their offices could probably consider sending a letter to ICE from the respective offices raising concerns about you know, the activities uh, such as the uh, June 20th uh, incident. They would probably have a chilling effect on conducting uh, the business of courthouses. So before they can do that, uh, it will be good for the Board of County Commissioners to send a letter to them, uh, just outlining their concerns, your concerns, if you're willing, related to the June 20th, 2019 incident. That is really uh, uh, the gist of this item, is whether you will be interested for me to draft a letter on your behalf to the federal delegation um, outlining concerns related to the uh, uh, ICE arrest of June 20th. Why, why do we need to ask them to do something? Why can't we just write a letter? To ICE? Oh, I don't know, maybe. Hey, please notify us if you're going to do this again or whatever. You have all the options. I'm just bringing you a request based on the meeting that I had with that, the, uh, the, those offices. If they thought it would be helpful, I'd support it. Yeah. Okay, so okay. I'll draft a letter for your consideration. And then, I mean, you're you're going to draft something, we have the option at that point in time to review what you draft and whether we agree or not. Uh, uh, as yeah. usual, that's sure. usually the process how it works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll go, yeah, put something together. I, I wouldn't put a stab signature on that one. See if you can make a rose out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so the next item that I have for you is called the manifest error on property assessments. And I, uh, you have a copy for you of uh, our Ordinance 15217, and also included is um, uh, the supporting documentation. What this really does is, uh, in gist, is when a, uh, the assessor makes an error in valuation, 
um, and this is and is uh, confirmed, uh, a citizen uh, may uh, request reimbursement for up to six years, and that's what it is. And the six years uh, is really is based on how often the assessor's office go through the evaluating those properties. And it's a six-year cycle they get to those properties again. So that is really the window of the six years. Um, as I stated on this, is aligned to the assessor going back every six years and reevaluating those properties. With the intent that at some point if, if, if the error was made six years down the road, you know, they correct that error and at that point a citizen will have the opportunity to get reimbursed for, uh, for six years. Uh, the commissioner's office received a request from a citizen asking the null that six years is too little and they would like to get reimbursed for longer than six years. So, um, Did they suggest a time? Uh, no, but uh, 20, you know. Um, so, and that's what I bring this uh, to, to your attention. Uh, my thought about that request is, is uh, extremely difficult um, to put parameters beyond the six years because the six years, again, is, is aligned to what this, the cycle in which the assessor uh, goes back around and, and assesses pro those properties. Whether they can hit in six years or not, this is just the cycle in which they go through it. Um, how, how does this uh, fit in with the Board of Equalization actions? Have any effect at all with that? Because is that an error? I mean, when when the Board of Equalization says no, no. property the board of is equal, not worth X. No, but the Board of Equalization is uh, is is somewhat of a dispute board between an assessment and somebody who doesn't agree with that assessment. This particular item is when the assessor actually confirmed there's, a, there's been an error on the evaluation. Like the citizen didn't know, but the assessor catches himself. Is yep. that the idea? Right. It says, oh, I overvalued you. Yeah. And then I've overvalued you for 20 years. It, it's a very narrow set of criteria that there might have been an error. And the assessor has to determine that, yes, there was an error. And what I recall at the time, there was extensive conversation uh, at the time this ordinance was adopted, after the state passed the manifest error legislation. <coughs> and what I recall at the time, they had a citizen who was um, strongly advocating for 20 years. He said, property had been inaccurately valued for 20 years and he wanted the, it, it was, is the discretion of the board how many years back, but as Romero said, uh, both the assessor and the treasurer at the time, Sean Myers, uh, explained why it would be extremely difficult to go back that far, um, but, but there was a lot of thought given in, to the concept of six years. I'd have to go back and, and look at it. But, but we talked extensively about how many years were appropriate mm -hmm. and realistic to be able to do the calculations. And again, my understanding of the history behind that decision was the six, year, six years was coinciding as to, again, how the assessors goes back every six years and, and hits every property. Mm -hmm. So, and that is the, the cycle, I believe, aligned. Whether that is three-year cycle, and they have three yeah. years so, to file, and, but but it is related to the cycle, and there were there were a lot. Of, I can't remember the details of those conversations. All I remember is we have a lot of them, mm -hmm. and both the trader and the assessor uh, gave very valid reasons why six years should be. This is and, a and it was a statewide. At the time the legislation was passed, um, there were statewide meetings of the treasurers who all were recommending this six-year limit. It, it's 
my understanding that the six year limit is pretty standard across the state. That's what I, so I, I think this is a citizen of my district, I want to say, because I know Thomasina was working on it, and when she brought it to me, my first question was, you know, did, if we're out of the box, you know, then I would think we should figure out why, but she didn't know, and it sounds like you're, saying, you're answering the question by saying that this was a recommendation and is pretty standard statewide. Of the statewide associations, they were recommending that there be a standard limit across the state. That was my unanswered question. And before it was codified, what was it? Before you, the previous, previous uh, before board? Before it was codified, there was, there was none. no allowance for manifest errors. This was new legislation. This is new. The state okay. Go ahead, Gary. I don't know if this applies, but last week we had a property come in front of us to dispose of, and we questioned whether maybe it was worth more. Anyway, I went out and looked at that property, and I think that was a hundred and fifty thousand dollar property. Yeah, I pulled the tax assessment, and, and what's the tax assessment on it? Uh, it's gone from a hundred and fifty. It's got really gone up and down, but it's uh, most currently down uh, at a hundred and six. It's gone one hundred and fifty all the way down to eighty seven, then oh. climbed. And now it's climbing back up again. It's a one hundred and six for the next year. I, I don't know, would this have any effect that we charged too many, too many taxes against that property? Or I just wonder, is there a connection here? This, I don't understand how come we have a hard time paying people back if, if they were wrongfully charged, I guess. I'm just trying to be, I mean, we're limiting, we'll only go back so far, but I, I need kind of an example, I guess. I don't understand how did they, but the person just didn't pay any attention to the tax bill and it was $10,000 too much? Or uh, On this property you're talking about? Yeah, well, yes, no, so on, on this issue that has now come up. And I don't know what happened on that other tax property and why the person quit paying on it. Uh, the one so the, 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 the treasurer is going to come and have a conversation with you on this particular parcel uh, next uh, Tuesday morning. So he's Which coming. One, Cooper Point or this one? The Cooper talking, Point. No, he's talking about the one. Uh, the, I'm talking actually about both of them. I've been talking well, about Cooper Point I and you, this. Well, uh, you know, I cannot speak yeah, about whether Cooper Point applies to this or not. So I, I, I don't have that information for you. I didn't know if we were overcharging uh, that I, I, person. I, I, That's the reason they uh, quit paying taxes. Well, I don't, I don't have that information because this has been in tax title since 1988. I know. It's been there a long time. 1988, before even this piece of legislation came. So okay. I, I can answer that question. So what question. did we do before this legislation came? Just said, sorry, you're out of luck? Yeah. yeah. So related to the Cooper Point property, <laughs> the, assessor is going to, uh, the treasurer okay. is going to come and have a conversation with you and for you to hear his perspective and answer any questions related to this property. Okay. Related to this, uh, I. I really don't know the details of this property owner who's, uh, who, who was arguing that she or he should deserve more than six year back taxes. I don't have the details of that property. How, how much money are we talking about? I, I don't have because in, can, in, in this case. Can we case, know some of that stuff before we make decisions? I like to know all the information on the topic that we're going to make a public policy decision. But it's, the it, decision we have is to, is this, we're being told six years. Th and we're not going to go yeah. beyond that. Right. So the decision is not on this particular request. But that's what brought it about. Do we want to contemplate do we want to, The to question is, do you want to contemplate for me to they start can. working with the, the, with the assessor for you to exercise changes to this legislation? I, I, that's I the don't. question. Apparently, this, is, this person has asked for 20 years I, reimbursement No, no, no. It's beyond, oh. it's be, beyond six time. years. Okay, I don't. So, but, the intent of this conversation is uh, for me not to solve an individual right. request. Sure. Is whether you like to open this up again. I just want to be fair question. with the citizens. Yeah. That's all. No. How about it? Do I want to open this up again? With this ordinance? This ordinance that was adopted by the board four years ago after the discernment process that lines up with 
other jurisdictions, or with we'll state, do we want to open it up again and, and look at changing that six-year limit? I don't. But how much are how much are we talking about to the citizen? Two hundred dollars, ten thousand. Well, I, 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 and again, I, I know you're not with all due respect, it, I, I will hate to bring an item to the commission, a legislative action, to try to resolve an individual's issue. Okay. That's not the intent. No, but I'm just looking at if we're going to use an example. I'd like to have all the My facts from the example. Quick. That's all I'm kind of saying. Uh, so based. The thing I wanted to know is whether we were out of the box in right. some way with this right. six-year rule, because I didn't know where it came from. I'm pretty comfortable that, that we're, we're, we're where everybody else is, although I have no, I understand where Commissioner Edwards is coming from. You kind of want to know what the scope of the error could be. Yeah. It's not really about this particular property, but I mean, you know, in terms of opening it up for 20 years, I don't have a sense of how much that could be. but. Um, so I don't. I don't think there's any rush. We. Could, I mean, I'm fine with if we want to delay our vote until we have that information, just as an as an example point. But at this point, I'm I'm not inclined to redo this rule if we're, if we're in line with other jurisdictions. Okay, I liked what uh, the commissioner said about maybe delay our vote. I just kind of hate to make decisions in a 10-minute discussion mm -hmm. that could have ramifications that affect people that we don't even know so about. So I'm, uh, I'm not asking you to make decisions, Commissioner. I'm asking you whether you'd like to entertain open this legislation. Oh. I don't you even can know, have I don't know what opening no. this legislation means. <laughs> open this legislation, open this for, for, for the assessor to come here to give you all that information that you need, everything that you're asking in order for you to exercise your option. I'm not asking you to say A or nay on changing to 10 years Kathy because you don't have the ability to do that right now. Yeah. Four years ago. Yeah. I'm open to information that can come forward and help us make better decisions. So what is the desire of the board? Um, I'm not interested. We already, did, we already did this four years ago and it's in line with, other, with the state and I'm fine with it. I got other things to deal with. Any any reason yeah, this couldn't be delayed for a while? I just got two votes. Oh, not just, just, so we're done with the conversation. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But okay. what is your vote? Well, if we find, out, <laughs> if we find well, out, I wanted to delay it. Well, well, Gary, if you find if we find something out and that you think it's pertinent, you can just bring it right back up, and we'll just put well, it. Well, yep. without it being a majority of the board, I can't even get staff to come forward and explain stuff. So I'm gonna. No, no, no. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm I think shot. you can. I'm shot I think now. you can. No, no, no. <laughs> a, a, any commission at any time can bring any pieces of legislation for consideration yeah. as, as you did today. Yeah. So okay. please don't feel you that um, property owners. You talk to anybody. Yeah. You're okay. hampered. Um, I'd like. I would like to know a little more about this. I don't know who I. Can find yeah. Out I'll, well, I'll, fo I'll follow up uh, with Thomasina. She had a little. She we'll has follow up with oh, okay. Yep. I nine seventy six. I'll try to be quick because I know we're short of time. Um, you have a copy of that in your packet. So, take a. I just wanted you guys to be aware of this. Uh, Inner City Transit uh, had somebody from the state come and give us a, an overview, and, and it's basically all encapsulated right here. What you need to understand is that if the if the car this is the car Tim Iman car tab initiative, if it passes. It will take seventy. Per, it will take seventy percent of the funds from this inter multimodal account. The things that are funded by the multimodal account are the Washington State Patrol, um, Amtrak, a bunch of um, you know bike and pedestrian trail grants, um, some WashDOT local programs related to transportation. It hits our entire rural transit program that that services the south part of our county. Um, all the different things in that in this green box here. Um, that are rural mobility grants, special needs, uh, regional mobility grant, commute trip, a bunch of program, van pool investments. It's going to mean $2 billion away from state and two, over $2 billion, $2.3 billion revenue loss to local governments over the next six years. Um, now, again, for example, the state patrol is almost entirely funded, I, what they explained, by this account. Now, now, the, just to be to be fair, the 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 person that was there presenting said, chances are, 
out of that 30% of the funding that's left, the state patrol would be a high priority to get that so that they don't lose funding. But that means that almost all the transportation pieces are going to go. Um, but at this point, there's no reason to, th the legislature hasn't picked any winners and losers. So at this point, state patrol's <clears> at risk, <throat> our public safety's at risk, therefore, our, our rural transit's at risk, and a lot of dollars to local government. So um, there was a suggestion that if local jurisdictions felt that this was bad uh, piece of policy that we would consider a, a resolution. Uh, you know, the county commission or C city of Olympia or Tumwater could pass a resolution so our local citizens knew that the, uh, could <coughs> know, know where we stand and, um, and send a message that this is not good for our local jurisdictions. Obviously, so I, my, my ask for you guys is that you take a look at this uh, FAQ here. Uh, it's three and a half pages that came with the, with the colors, yeah. colored one. If you guys would take a look at that, and maybe next week we could talk about whether we would be willing to pass a resolution. I'd appreciate it. If not, that's fair, but I thought you guys would want to know this. We're, we're, we know how cash-strapped we are here locally, and this is going to really hit us, especially our, our, our rural areas and potentially our public safety. State Patrol is going to be scrambling for dollars just like uh, the other stuff. Last, uh, is that it? Oh, just one more thing. Yeah. For transportation benefit districts, interestingly enough, we haven't, we have not uh, adopted a funding mechanism. It invalidates, if you're a TBD that did a car tab, it's gone. If you're a TBD that did sales tax, it's not. So um, if we were going to consider something, this legislation may affect. It's just a little interesting. Yeah, the city of Olympia will be directly affected. Olympia will be hit. Tumwater will oh not, because Tumwater yeah, did yeah, the sales yeah, tax. Not, not even uh, Lacey wouldn't either, because they had a sales tax as well. But uh, Olympia will be hurt badly. Yeah. This last uh, Friday, I was in Ellensburg for a WASAC conference, and uh, it just an eye opener. And at the very, very end was uh, a representative or senator Jake Fye. Uh, right was there from the 27th district, Pierce County, and he spoke to this initiative. And he put it almost the same you did, Ty, but he actually said uh, to a room full of counties from around the state, if you have, uh, if this passes, if you have any road projects, culverts, bridges, don't bother starting them because you won't finish them. You will not get money from the state. It just will not be there. And I asked if uh, uh, the mile uh, tax or the mile use or use per mile, whatever you know, the vehicle miles travel. Road, yeah, uh, if that it was, it was not going to negate the gas tax any further or even reduce it. And he says, no, it won't. It won't. Um, but he said, this is it's going to be devastating, devastating to the state when it comes to roads. What brought this all on? Was this the business where they were? overcharging for some type of car tabs in the north part in Snohomish and King County Yeah, this or is uh, related to the sound transit yeah. uh, where, ballot. Where the blue book value or something, is that what brought all this about? The government basically misleading the public? Is yeah, that in that particular item, uh, it will be in front of the uh, state Supreme Court. Um, the whole uh, sound transit it, ballot it's measure. It's still in front of the court yet? Uh, I think they, they agreed to hear it. I think they heard it, but I don't think they have. No ruling um, yet? The ruling yet. So I'm with you. Uh, we can chew on it and read, out, read it, and, but yeah, I'd I'll, be in favor of putting something I'll out. bring this item again next week. Thank you. All right. OK, we're out of time. <laughs> we got uh, Faith Harvest Helpers. So uh, here's, uh, and this is, you heard public testimony related to uh, this particular occasion. Again, uh, maybe three, four weeks ago, uh, the Olympian ran an article related to this particular activities on this parcel. This is along uh, Kaiser Road. Um, and um, the, the reason that I'm bringing this to your attention, uh, you heard some of the public testimony, the county has not done much. Um, and uh, uh, I believe to the contrary, right here is the timeline uh, of uh, all the activities the, the county and county staff has been involved related uh, to this particular violations. 
I'm not here to state that this, uh, this uh, parcel is not uh, with, uh, in violation. They are. But also they're in the process, I believe, to make it uh, right in, because they have submitted a reasonable use exception permit. So um, anyways, um, so I just want to make sure that, that, that you see uh, chronologically the activities associated with this particular uh, compliance issue. Um, and I'm hoping to go through this this afternoon in response to the public testimony that you received. Um, but I don't think there's uh, some of the uh, neighbors, there is not a silver bullet at this point as to how we can probably meet the expectations of some of the public comment that you receive. Um, anyways, um, there's really uh, an option of, um, it, uh, as I believe as of late, the <coughs> staff has not seen any active construction activity. Uh, they will result on uh, stop work uh, type of uh, order. But if certainly, if, um, if they, this permit, they have applied the, um, the reasonable use exception permit, um, that's in materialized, then other options needs to be taken place. Um, and there's also those other options are outlined on the second page on the next steps for you. Um, anyways, do you want to add? Sure. Go ahead. So Joshua Cummings, the Director of Community Planning and Economic Development. And uh, so there's a couple of different layers here and the county manager touched on uh, some of the important pieces. But I wanna make sure that we kind of set the stage uh, and go back a little bit. The values of CPED are transparency, consistency, and accountability. And our mission is to serve citizens. And so it can get uh, somewhat um, confusing when we have an applicant which is a citizen that comes in trying to do a project and we've heard from the direction of the Board of County Commissioners that we're to try and help applicants do with their land what they want within code and ordinance. Uh, there are sometimes violations on a property and we seek to address those when an applicant comes in with an application. Secondly, we often have citizens that are neighbors to an applicant property that are um, noticing that there are things that are with outside of our uh, compliance and our codes and ordinances. And so we also, within CPED, have a compliance investigation division. And so while we could be assisting an applicant with their application, we may also be investigating compliance, uh, out of compliance claims. And it can be frustrating for both the applicant and the neighbors when we're working to serve both of their needs. But that is the position that CPED is in. It's to serve the citizens, even when there is conflict, as part of our civil society. And so one of the things that we've tried to accomplish is to make it more clear in terms of the timeline and the actions that have been taken, the violations that are currently uh, under review, and the violations that may be trying to be uh, addressed. And so with this item in particular, there are kind of two pieces to it, and I'll let Brett dive more deeply into the details and answer any questions, but essentially, there are violations that are known that the applicant is working to correct or address, and that's through the reasonable use exception, RUE, which is, comes out of the hearings examiner discussion, which this applica applicant requested to postpone that hearings examine, examiner meeting, uh, and we honored that request. Secondly, there are other violations that may have occurred that are outside of the RUE that they've applied for, and our compliance group is investigating those and will take action, as it says in next steps on the timeline. Notice of violation for any structures, activities beyond the scope of the RUE application will be enforced. So again, it's these two paths where we're serving the applicant as the citizen and we're serving the neighbors that are uh, providing complaints on a certain property. It's frustrating, it's confusing, but it's part of our civil society. What are, what are you looking for? No, no, is this just information? That's just information uh, so for you. So it just and, takes a while to fix the problem, whatever. And, uh, and I'm gonna walk through in a high level this afternoon in response to the oh. uh, public testimony you received okay. at the last two meetings. Kind of responding to the okay. fact we aren't doing anything yeah. kind of a thing or yeah. something? Okay. It gets very suspicious to both citizens and you and myself when year after year the same allegations are made. And, and my patient has communicated this to Josh. I mean, anybody can make mistakes or you know try to skirt the rules or whatever. And we reach out and we work with people, and that's absolutely the right way to approach it. But my tolerance level starts to drop precipitously when there's the same 
pa pattern. Yeah, the same pattern. I mean, RV living comes up in 2016, 2017, 2019. So obviously this is ongoing. And when people are worked with, and then, it, you know, people like this, we hear all the time of citizens who say, oh, we, I know how to get around county rules, and, you know, I know how to, to, to strip, you know, the rules. And, 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 we, and we, we've heard the stories of our lack of, you know, resources, you know, for um, sometimes in compliance. So, you know, I think that, People deserve a chance to work with us and get problems resolved in an amicable way. And then, if they show a pattern of not wanting to follow um, code, then that's where you know my patience level really drops. And I think that the neighbors are feeling the same way. And so, just to address that. Um, that is actually one of the intents of this document. We, did, we haven't had a template in this way previously uh, to kind of get that history and timeline all in one place. Uh, but as a response-driven uh, organization, we, only, we don't seek out um, violations. We respond to violations when we receive a complaint. And then if that violation is remedied, so say the RV is moved off the property or somebody's not living in the RV, from our perspective and the way that Title 26 works, it's cleared. And if that violation occurs in the future, we will react to that in the future. But ensuring that we've got all of that history in one place, I think helps to start that first conversation about if people have a tendency to repeat some violations. And you'll also see in the very back page, uh, Brett has provided a picture of where the violations are uh, occurring and just kind of a high level of what they are. This document, we hope will be, like I said, a template for future difficult properties that have uh, different perspectives that we're working through and can be made public to the folks that request it. So that there is one single area where people can see what's happening in the information in terms of timeline and the violations. Well, what was that one case that we had, uh, and I think we went 17 years. That was uh, along Kaiser Road. Kaiser Road. Yeah. Burnell, Burnell, Burnell case. 20 I'm years sorry. to resolve yeah. it. Was it 20 years? OK. I guess I'd worked on it for 17 years. Yeah. <laughs> health department or something. But boy, some of these can get complicated in that field yeah. process and everything that goes with it. And, and they're, they're extremely complicated. It did take us 20 years on that one. And yeah. We, we just finished it last year, I think. <laughs> But I can certainly sympathize with Commissioner Minister's yeah, frustration. Um, and, uh, and as soon as we file a violation, they issue, they, they ask for a permit, they come to a compliance, and they, they go ahead and do something different, uh, uh, submit a permit, they get into compliance, they do something different. So, yeah. Can, can I ask a question? Ask me? No. <laughs> okay. Brett, probably. Uh, I'm just kind of curious on your last page here, and then we've got water services, and living, RV, whatever. Off to the left there, open storage. What does that, what does open storage mean? Those like shipping containers, or what are they? <coughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Speaking of the paper. <laughs> Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Brett Burris, Building and Planning Manager for Community Planning and Economic Development. In the <laughs> upper left-hand corner, those are semi-trailers used for storage. They also have shipping containers on the property as well. And do we have provisions against those kind of things? We, we do have provisions for open storage, and that's one of the things we're investigating right now is to determine uh, what level of open storage is permitted or not permitted per our code. Like, are these highway trailers where they license vehicles of some kind and they take them out once in a while and bring them back? I mean, you know, They've I, been, know, I don't know very much about this whole thing. They have been lined up in that position for uh, some time now. Uh, I'm not going to say years. I'll say maybe weeks or a month or so. Uh, I just know them to be there and not used and used uh, just for storage uh, while they build the two pole barns that have been permitted to be constructed, which are up in the upper left-hand side of the photograph. So, oh, you yeah. still going? Well, wow, those were permitted or something? Yeah. It said, I thought I saw where the two pole barns were permitted. There's an active permit application for both pole barns right now. The pole barns are not completed, and they have not been finaled for final inspection. Well, that's under December 14, 2016, two 
school buildings, permits issued. Yes, sir. They're just not done with the project, but they did get permits for it or something. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. okay, well, I'm not going to know. So I have a question for Josh. I have a question for Josh, or maybe for Brett. <laughs> Reading the uh, September 10th, the red line, the entire red line, and looking at the schematic, uh, you have listed at the very end septic and water, but I don't see septic in the diagram. Uh, but where, what's the septic issue? Because they're right next to wetlands. So they just, is it raw dumping, or what's, what's the septic issue? <clears throat> on September 10th, there was a joint investigation by environmental health, community planning, and economic development to go out there. And I don't want to speak on behalf of environmental health, but there were uh, connections to these septic systems for which this property has three. Uh, for uh, the units, trailers, and people living in them. So there was a, a non-permitted connection. As it relates to water, um, the well... Uh, they've ran pipes from the well to different parts of the site and created spigots, and those spigots are used as a water source for these trailers, That's part of the ongoing investigation. which is also part of the ongoing investigation. Okay, and there's, so far there's 25 violations. Okay, good briefing. You don't need direction because I think you know where I was, but what I would say. But no, and you. just to honor the you know citizens that are concerned. We are working towards transparency and consistency and accountability. And at the, as that first sheet shows, we're also collaborating with public health and social, social services, which environmental health is part of. So we're working to move forward in all the different directions that we're requested and required to do so. And is this group doing things for the food bank? What, what, what's that about canning fish in the food bank? Is there any kind of permitting process that we're overseeing? The reasonable use exception application includes using one of the pole barns as a cannery uh, for fish. Uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of Faith Harvest Helpers, but uh, they do serve food, uh, canned fish, uh, to different uh, organizations in the community, and they also state, I believe, their website nationwide. So they're trying to do good things. That's what well, the hearings examiner discussion yeah, is for. Yeah, we don't make a judgment. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. And at 12.07 and a half, if there's a burning issue to get out, uh, Commissioner Menser has one. I have a citizen that's, uh, we've run out of time the last few weeks, and she watches these meetings and she's been emailing. I promised her I would bring this to your attention for whatever, for what it's worth. Um, it's a citizen that was lives uh, in my district who had a mailbox that was destabilized by our snow plowing activities. Mm. Um, she, uh, apparently our, our county policy is that if our, if our plow strikes the mailbox, um, then we take responsibility. But if it doesn't strike it, even if it caused the damage, so for example, if it pushes snow up against the mailbox and destabilizes it, the, the, the county equipment didn't actually touch the mailbox, but it clearly um, caused damage. We, we don't take responsibility. So she and I debated back and forth, you know, what is it, what is, what is your ask that we have a, a change in that policy to where it's caused by, even if it doesn't require touching of the county property the mailbox, or is it some kind of case by case? What she really wanted, and I talked to her about the difficulty of it, but what she really wanted was a case by case exception on, you know, uh, one of the two. And, and, she, and she really just wanted someone to help her dig the hole for her mailbox, which I almost felt like going out and digging for it. But anyway, I promised her as a result of that conversation that I would let you guys know that this happened and that there was that request. And you know, maybe you think about it. We talked about it because I know we're out of time. Last winter. Last winter. Winter. This it happened, happened in February. She's been working with it, and she wow. she has some other. Um, complaints that relate to um, like how she was communicated with and treated by some of the public works folks that she tried to, to, to communicate with. She took pictures of her mailbox, for example, one example, she took pictures of her mailbox right after it happened, contacted public works, they kind of didn't, kind of discounted that and suggested that maybe her pictures were, were you know, not accurate because one of the staff members apparently said he had pictures and there was no damage and she's like, I want to see those pictures. And so there was a little bit of back and forth about that and I 
I've addressed that issue. That's really not the issue I promised to bring to you guys. The issue I promised to bring to you guys was about accounting policy. Should well, we be limited to situations where, should our responsibility be limited to situations where our property actually touches the citizen's property, or should it be broader, or should there be some kind of an exception process? It seems, it seems to me, if you have an open window, with what the law says, if there you have an open window of your residence, and I reach in and steal something that's, that's, that's entering asked them. the house, or entering the property, but if I use like a little uh, claw thing, but I don't enter the property, that's constructive entering. There is construct, there's possession of alcohol or drugs, and there's constructive possession of, of that. And so it seems to me if we push a, a pile of snow into someone's thing and bust it, we didn't touch it, but it's like constructive. It was. I, I see that, and I was, apparently Public Works would, would be able to tell us, if we want to explore this further, that there's a lot of folks that have like rickety fences. Yeah. And, and like there's a, just a lot of situations that happen. With that much snow. That would be difficult. And, and then you get in a situation where an unscrupulous citizen might say, you know, like the, their fence fell down because it fell down. Cause, and they would use the opportunity to say, oh, well, you push snow. I don't know. I mean, yeah. whether that would expand things too far or, or be too much of an administration difficulty. I just promised to raise this issue so that you guys could think about it. Okay. I guess uh, that was an emergent situation, I guess, that particular snowstorm. And I think our staff did the best we could under probably adverse conditions. I, without and knowing any more than that, uh, I guess. Yeah. Commissioner Mason and I had a conversation about this, and, and I did raise the concerns about precedent setting in terms of changing the policy and everything else, because in this case, it may be just uh, the small bo the uh, mailbox, but fences and everything else. We and will be an administrative uh, uh, nightmare. They will hear what each case have the validity or not. Um, it also, um, uh, you know, Mr. Commissioner mentioned the, the citizen has the opportunity to file a complaint uh, through the uh, our uh, um, the risk. The risk. Uh, cool. And she's uh, not going to win that because she can't prove that yeah. there was t there was yeah. contact between the plot. She acknowledges that. Yeah, but but also that's a third party who looks every single claim separate from from uh, the policies that we have. So she has that option at this point. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Do you have a burning issue that's got to get out at twelve twelve? No, kind of interesting. We went from you know hundred dollar issue to. $500 million issue. <laughs> yeah. So, All right. We're in recess now, and uh, oh no, we're uh, adjourning this meeting, and then we'll re-adjourn it to o'clock for the VOCC. Thanks for watching.